Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to share some of our work on school wastewater monitoring in Houston, Texas. Um, this is really a collaborative effort led by the Houston Health Department and uh, in collaboration with us here at Rice University. Um, okay, let me make sure I can control the screen. There we, there we go. Okay, so just as a quick overview and to give some context for our school wastewater monitoring program, it lives within our larger monitoring program where we sample from uh, 39 wastewater treatment plants, lift stations, but actually the majority of our sampling sites are facility level. So we sample at 75 manholes and uh, the majority of those manhole sites are uh, at public schools. So about 50, 52 public schools are sampled uh, weekly across Houston. And so this map here on the right just shows all the sewer sheds in different colors and all of the facility level samples are shown as little dots on this map. So I'm gonna focus on the school monitoring um, and really the, the motivation uh, behind this is that uh, respiratory viruses are a leading cause of hospitalizations in children. And uh, previous research has actually shown that schools can be sources of respiratory viral outbreaks within communities. Um, so there's really an interest in better, more rapid, um, and just additional surveillance uh, in school settings uh, because existing surveillance systems are likely undercounting cases, um, uh, especially with some of these diseases that might be uh, low, uh, have low you know, asymptomatic in children. So here is a map that shows where uh, we're sampling from uh, schools across Houston. We have three kind of clusters of schools uh, across Houston, this North cluster, uh, Southeast cluster and Southwest cluster. Um, these schools were identified uh, to be part of this program uh, back in 2020 when we were setting it up um, because they were all located in zip codes with high positivity rates. Um, and in terms of how long we've been doing this, uh, you know, we started doing wastewater mining at a citywide level in March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And then by December of 2020, we were um, sampling from these uh, 50 or so schools and analyzing the wastewater for SARS-CoV-2. So at this point, we have about two and a half school years worth of data for SARS-CoV-2 uh, from these uh, 50 schools. Uh, and since then, we have added on additional respiratory virus targets. So in September of 2021, uh, we added on influenza. And then in September of 2022, we added RSV. Um, so we have about two and one year of school uh, data for those two respiratory viruses. And now we're um, also thinking about and working on expanding to additional targets that are not just respiratory viruses, which I'm really not going to talk about uh, right now, but I'm happy to talk about in the discussion. In terms of how these samples are collected, um, we have refrigerated auto samplers actually located in manholes that we that were identified in collaboration with uh, Houston Public Works um, uh, that only get wastewater from those schools. And so these uh, refrigerated auto samplers sit either within a manhole right outside the school or adjacent to it. Um, and these are programmed to basically collect a sample every 15 minutes to create a composite over the school day or approximate school day. So they run generally from about 6 a.m. to noon and then a team of Houston Health Department staff actually drives these routes to pick up these school samples uh, once per week and then drop those samples uh, either at my lab or the Houston Health Department lab uh, where they're analyzed. So now I'll get into showing some of the data. Um, this, uh, these are heat maps that are showing the detections of the three respiratory viruses, um, SARS-CoV-2, influenza A, and RSV, over the 2022-2023 school year. Um, so the schools are shown on the y-axis and then the date is on the x-axis. And if we detected that disease target uh, for SARS-CoV-2, it's shown in red, uh, purple for influenza and red again for RSV. If it was below the detection limit, it's shown in blue um, or green for influenza and RSV. And then if it was inconclusive, which means that usually one replicate was positive and one replicate was negative, uh, so typically you're right at that detection limit. It's shown in either yellow uh, or pink. Um, so 
as you can see, especially for you know SARS-CoV-2, we had the most detections. Uh, levels were generally higher for SARS-CoV-2 than for influenza A and RSV. Uh, the majority of the samples for influenza A and RSV were negative, but you can definitely see that there was this surge uh, in time that occurred really around that period when we were experiencing uh, what the news was talking about in terms of the tridemic. And so we saw really this concurrent surge of influenza A and RSV in the schools. And actually SARS-CoV-2 uh, lagged a little bit in terms of when we saw a surge of, of SARS-CoV-2 um, across the schools. So to better understand and assess the value of the school wastewater um, for understanding infectious disease spread, both in that school, but also in the broader community, we asked a few questions of our data. So the first question that we asked was whether wastewater levels were indicative of an infection in the schools. Um, so to do this, uh, we worked with um, the available clinical testing data that we had. So we're lucky in that the Houston Health Department was also running a free testing program for COVID-19 um, in the 2021-2022 school year, where they offered free testing um, at 46 schools, and they had 13 weeks of this. Um, this, uh, of course, uh, parents had to consent to have their kids participate, and even if the kids part, uh, the parents con consented, then they actually did have to participate. And so this, um, while this was great to compare to, is actually a pretty sparse data set, and probably, um, you know, a pretty limited uh, clinical testing set to compare the wastewater to. Um, but when we looked um, and we compared, we used logistic regression to compare the wastewater concentrations for the schools that also had this paired clinical testing data. We did in fact see this uh, significant and positive relationship between the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater samples and the probability of a positive test at the school. Um, so even with this imperfect data, in that the testing was nowhere near comprehensive, um, and most of the uh, and obviously the uncertainty of whether you know in 2021, 22 we weren't even sure if kids were going to be using the bathroom and whether we were going to get a signal. We did see still see this um, this significant and positive relationship, with, which gave us some confidence that the wastewater levels were indicative of infections within the schools. Um, the next question that we asked uh, was whether the wastewater concentrations at the schools were reflective and associated with the positivity rates of uh, the communities. So here we aggregated uh, the schools based on uh, what zip code they were located in. And then we looked at the average SARS-CoV-2 concentration in those schools within the same zip code. And then we compare those to the zip code positivity rates. Um, so. And again, we saw this significant and positive association between the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 um, at the school at the school in the school wastewater and the zip code positivity rate. So this is showing that the schools are actually reflective of community positivity rates. And we've done this for two school years now. I'm just showing the 2022-2023 data, but we also did this for the previous school year, the 21-2022 school year data. And so finally, to also look at our influenza and RSV data in a similar way, um, there was much less clinical testing available for um, influenza and RSV. And so to compare uh, our school wastewater data um, to other existing surveillance data, we decided to look at syndromic data. So this was if you go to an emerging department or a healthcare testing facility and you get diagnosed with something and you have a discharge diagnosis of either influenza or RSV, uh, we looked at the percentage of those visits that were discharge diagnosed as influenza and RSV. And then we compared that uh, rate of discharge diagnosed influenza to the proportion of the schools with positive wastewater detections uh, for both influenza and RSV. And we did see this positive and significant association for influenza um, for these citywide influenza rates and uh, the number of schools with positive detections. And we also saw a positive relationship with RSV it was not significant. This was really largely due to the autocorrelation and the time series data. Um, but this, this lets us see, okay, not only are the wastewater levels reflective of infections at the school, infections at the zip code level, but also reflective of kind of citywide levels of disease burden. And so we think about selecting sites that could be used to tell us something about not just you know, facility level infections, we could also potentially use schools as sites to tell us something about community level infections. 
And so I'll just have a couple more slides where I want to talk about how this data was used by the Houston Health Department. And Dr. Peirce is on later, so he can talk a lot more about this. Um, uh, the school's results are reported back each week to the nurses, to the superintendents. Um, and uh, during uh, the peak COVID emergency period, uh, the health department really used the schools as a springboard into the community to encourage vaccinations. So this is just a picture of a fact sheet that's put together where um, uh, information about school detections, uh, school wastewater detections was shown alongside uh, vac vaccination rates for the communities. And they would use this information to try and encourage folks to get vaccinated. And another thing that was done is actually free vaccine uh, clinics were held at two of the elementary schools that are participants in the school monitoring program, uh, Lyons Elementary and Barrick Elementary, where they offered free influenza and COVID vaccines um, at these schools. Um, and then uh, members of our team have also done a study where they've looked at um, and tried to understand how wastewater data is used by a range of stakeholders to uh, make decisions and, and drive actions associated with uh, COVID-19 prevention and mitigation within the schools. And one of the main findings that, came that we came away with from the study was that maximizing the utility of wastewater surveillance in schools will really require um, educating school staff about what wastewater data is, how to use it, where to find it, um, and improving com communication with um, the stakeholders that are receiving this information. And so one example of uh, something that the health department has done with this data is Dr. Purse held this uh, webinar with school nurses where we actually walk through kind of how to interpret the school wastewater data. Um, and uh, at the end of this webinar, he also surveyed them and asked them, you know, how is having a better understanding of wastewater uh, and its implication or is having a better understanding of wastewater and its implication help me understand to plan and implement strategies to reduce the risk of COVID-19 infection on my campus. And uh, the, most of the participants uh, responded with agree or strongly agree, which was really a positive feedback um, from the stakeholders on this program. So we're really focusing now on how to continue to improve communications to uh, schools and work with schools so they can interpret and use this information from the wastewater. Um, and so with that, I will conclude and acknowledge that this is really the work of a large, amazing collaborative team, Dr. Hopkins, Dr. Enzer, uh, Kelsey Catton, and Julia Shudler helped with the analysis that I showed today. And we've published some of this work um, in Water Research if you'd like to read more about it. And I'm happy to take questions at their time or wait to the end when we have a discussion. Thank you, Lauren. Um... I'm going to use the, the chair's prerogative and get one question in, <laughs> and then we'll hopefully have time for others at, at the end. Um, one of the things, because you did multiple schools, have you looked what would be the most, um, I guess, the most efficient um, number of schools that would give you the same outcome data? That is, you, you know, it would just put imaginary budgetary constraints on this. You could only test a certain number of schools. Um, did you look at that in terms of what would be kind of the most parsimonious approach to giving you the same data from a community perspective? Obviously, it wouldn't give you the same data from a specific facility, but in terms of the community, did you look at like, could you just pick one school instead of four or five? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know if we've done the analysis to answer that, but we definitely see very different patterns of detections at the different schools. So there's some schools that are, you know, almost always positive, um, yeah, which is, and then some schools where it's pretty sparse. And so I think we have a lot more work to do to understand why that is, you know, is there anything about anything from like, you know, the sampling to the, to the populations that we're serving. And so I think, um, you know, we'd have to take, that into account. And I guess my question would be like, what would we be comparing it to? The community level positivity rates is what you're thinking about? Um, yes. Like to know that this is the right number of schools to capture. Yeah. Right. So, so now using the schools basically as, as sentinel sites reflective of the community rather than telling you what's happening in that school. I, I realize that's a different purpose, but it kind of comes to this larger question of you know, how you, how you allocate your resources most efficiently. 
Yeah, I think that's certainly something we we could look at. Yeah, I think you're right in that this was largely set up not really as a sentinel site uh, study, but more sure. to, to help serve the schools. But if we needed to pare down and think about maybe one school is representative of all the schools in that neighborhood, right. we could do that analysis and try and cluster them maybe at a more a finer geographic level and see if that hypothesis is true. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, we, we can get back to that question. It's, I think it's really interesting and your data certainly would would shed some light on, on that big question. Um, Let's move on to um, the second presentation, which is monitoring correctional facilities in Ohio. And that's going to be presented by, by uh, Mark Weir. So, Mark. Some kind of security alert. I'll just ignore that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I should have control and power. Yep. Uh, your slides are showing up great. Great. All right. So thank you for uh, for having me. Um, uh, with regards to this, uh, a lot of the learning that we did um, in correctional facilities is not moving. There it is now. Um, a lot of the movement that we did in correctional facilities was also some other things that we were learning in other locations, like on campus, um, a couple of different study sites in Louisville and things like that. And it's what I'm going to be talking about is a kind of a culmination of those and then bring it back specific to um, what we have found effectively as best practices for Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. So if you see ODRC, that's Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, there's 33 correctional facilities that are all being monitored, um, either twice a week sampling, composite sampling, or uh, ramped down to once a week sampling for some of them where COVID effectively disappeared along the way. Um, as a general refresher to an extent, what, what I'm gonna be talking about is much more on the mathematical computational side of things. So I'm not gonna be showing any data. Um, I, I wouldn't really be able to show any data uh, since it's for correctional uh, facilities, but um, it's also not really what I'm, I'm mostly focused on. Um, but effectively you have a population that's shedding out um, SARS-CoV-2 signal. We find that using molecular methods. We're still using um, quantitative methods for ODRC. So everything's still run through digital droplet PCR. There are uh, some investigation that we're doing elsewhere for the passive samplers for effectively qualitative data. Um, and we're test bedding the analyses there before we integrate that into ODRC because that way ODRC doesn't have to spend extra uh, money on more sampling just to look at the, the passive samplers. Um, once we go there, what we've been doing is trying to build a digital twin. We've been trying to effectively say, from this signal, what does that, that uh, inform us? So we've been testing a number of different AI algorithms as well as mechanistic modeling. Uh, mass balance approaches seem to be doing really quite well overall by way of what we're, what we're able to estimate <clears throat> but they're they're a little tricky to um, develop properly, and then optimization can be a little little challenging. Uh, one thing that we did learn um, is being able to figure out whether or not you have a sample of convenience or if you have a targeted sample. So when we're talking about a correctional institute, and I you know, can't really show you a map for obvious reasons, but imagine a cluster of buildings in one section and then some pockmarked other buildings, and that's all within a fence wire. So anything inside the wire, that is the um, correctional facility housing area. And then there are um, administrative offices, there's correctional officer offices, there's um, visitation areas, there's all these other, other areas that are not housing. Um, and then housing is where a lot of the environmental controls get put in place. So when we're, we're looking at using wastewater-based epidemiology or wastewater monitoring to be able to understand what it is that we need to try and do moving forward to either improve overall health within the correctional facilities or to limit uh, spread. So the, the main purview of, or the main focus of everything within Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections is for the safety, the care, and the actual rehabilitation of offenders. Um, 
So there's a lot of different on-the-job training, there's off-job training, there's educational resources outside of job training. Um, there's a lot of different substance abuse, um, <clears throat> excuse me, substance abuse, uh, rehabilitation and care that goes into it. So there's a lot of communal activities that need to be maintained because the point of a correctional facility is to try to drive towards rehabilitation of somebody who has offended um, in breaking the law. So that is the paramount operation of it, other than keeping them safe and keeping them healthy as possible, which is challenging because it's communal living in a lot of them. So do you ever hear a term open bay prisons? Just think of like a classic military barracks. That's effectively what you have. Um, so in what we've been focusing on primarily is trying to look at multiple ways of signal processing. So we have a time series that's coming through and everybody understands basically what that means is that you have a, you have a, a signal that's uh, originating into an environmental media based on a time period of when it gets shed into the, the wastewater. The challenge that is interesting and in that as we start unpacking it, we're able to do a little bit better on using these data in the overall risk management scheme of ODRC. So what we've landed on that that's most reliable is any number of different flavors of a moving average. They're, they're, they're fairly simple. Um, there's not a lot of complexity that goes into how they operate. Um, and they do just as well as a lot of other options. There are other approaches that um, we've been experimenting on with regards to AI approaches. Now that we have reams of data coming through and we can match that over to human testing as well. There's a lot of different options that that opens up, but in reality, what it effectively is, and I'm kind of demonstrating it here, is you have effectively two different signals based on when you're doing your sampling, and then you start compounding that further. Um, so it would be X, then Y, then Z, then on, on you go for each snapshot that you're taking overall. Now we're, we're, we're accumulating those as an overall aggregate signal coming through, but they are coming from the same fundamental source. But remember what I said, you have the housing units within a correctional facility, and then you have the uh, the, the actual buildings that are main, maintaining it and operating it. Where do you want to try and set your focus? We can't actually put an auto sampler at the outfall from each one of those buildings because the manhole covers are welded shut so nobody escapes through the sewer system. Um, so we can't actually get a sampler down in there. So we have to be able to look at it from where is the signal coming through to where we can actually sample it outside that wire and then try and trace that back to housing because that's where the majority of our environmental controls are when we're talking about risk management. Um, so what we've been able to do with regards to how we operate within ODRC is that we have some fairly strict constraints. Um, we really can't, you know, so we have to fit everything within our overall risk management uh, framework. So um, masking is not something that is either ideal or possible, depending on the level of security of the facility that we're talking about. Um, also, there's enough stress in this environment in and of itself, both from the offender population as well as the correctional officer population, that having that additional barrier of having everybody in a mask is just not something that's conducive to safe operations of correctional facility. So what we've been doing is we've been making sure that the wastewater is either a confirmatory or a leading um, indicator of any changes that we need to do with regards to all other environmental controls. ODRC has a ramp up, ramp down risk management policy that wastewater monitoring is a critical component to. So when we ramp up, we control um, how we're actually kind of moving people around into which job categories, how they line up to be able to get the job categories, whether or not the commissary is open, whether or not the barbershop is open, how many people can go through. Those are all uh, population and some level of environmental controls that we have that wastewater will help indicate whether or not they need to be ramped up or whether or not we're at enough of a safety margin where they can start getting ramped down. So that's why a robust risk management plan, it was a critical step to being able to use uh, WBE or waste monitor monitoring in a much more realistic and efficacious way for ODRC. Um, I'm calling out, they, they call it 
and they you know they keep telling me they call it this it's it's but anyway there's the weird methods and the weird barrier it's just ways of having offenders sleep in an open bay prison and then there's a barrier in between that we used a couple different modeling approaches and then wastewater as a um a verification point about whether or not these things are actually working so um there's a lot of different ways of being able to control it but wastewater is a nice way of getting an aggregate overall view of what's happening within that population because as we're trying to move through these different hierarchy of controls we need some kind of evidence that will get us there to move forward so the way we operate it is we have the monitoring data come streaming in to a uh, monte carlo algorithm or monte carlo simulation with, with that we're also now testing um uh, recursion methods to be able to try and get away from the monte carlo the monte carlo is an iterative process that just takes a lot of time the more data you have streaming into it um so what we're trying to do is trying to look at some recursion methods that would be able to get us away from the monte carlo so that this is going to run a lot faster if we get to a point where it's going to be an emergency again and we need to make decisions quickly um not going it's going i'm trying to go to the next slide but i don't see that's going Oh, did I go too far? Oh, I, I missed a slide. Um, so, um, let's see. Yep. Huh. Okay. Um, I must have not sent the other one. Anyway, so where it's where this is going now into the future is two different areas. So, what ODRC is interested in is being able to support this ramp up, ramp down concept. So how do we improve being able to ramp up and ramp down different controls? Is there a way of being able to incorporate other infectious disease agents that we may be concerned with? Again, it's it's communal living um, in a lot of the open bay settings, because once you're at a minimum security level, you can have these more open bay types of settings. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, what is also somewhat challenging or what what's also the next piece to this is again trying to get ahead of what that uh, next evolutionary step is for SARS-CoV-2 or if there's another one that we coming down the line um, right now ODRC is not really doing discovery with regards to that but they're interested in being able to incorporate it so that's where a lot of it all the work of well how do we actually use forward thinking and forward looking wastewater monitoring to say what's the next possible epidemic or pandemic level threat computationally so that they can in integrate that much more rapidly that's another piece where they're they're quite interested in looking at and the other one is where they have significantly expanded out to drugs of abuse so like i said the ohio department of rehabilitation corrections takes corrections and safety very seriously Drug use and drug sales inside of a correctional facility are a highly dangerous uh, business and all as well as activity. What we're trying to do is make sure that people who have a history of using drugs that leads to criminal activity outside of using the drugs as well, obviously, um, can be limited by getting them um, clean and sober on, on these aspects. So what we've started to do is expand this out, looking at the same time in the same locations for um, cocaine, methadone, methamphetamines, oxycontin, uh, type of codeine, and heroin. Um, so what we're seeing is overall, uh, no, well, it, it, with regards to infectious diseases, there isn't really any kind of correlation, uh, and we wouldn't expect one on that. But that's one of those next le next steps where they're taking wastewater monitoring is what infectious agents should we also be concerned about getting ourselves ready in a one of those ramp up ramp down type of uh, 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 risk management plans and then where can we move this for all of our other priorities such as drugs abuse and um uh, and other other things that we're trying to control i'll leave uh leave some time for questions and if you need my email i think everybody has my email but if you need it it's on the the last slide all right, thank you, Mark. Um, I think we we might be able to sneak one question in if there if someone wants to raise their hand. Stephanie, do you see any questions popping up? Nope. 
not yet. So we'll we'll have additional time for questions at yep, the end as well. well. Yep. Let's move on. Um, thank you very much, Mark, uh, to our next speaker, uh, uh, Rachel Poretsky, who's going to speak to us about airport monitoring. Super. Thanks. Um, I also. Yes. OK, great. So um, I, I was also asked to uh, comment on um, other sentinel surveillance and healthcare facilities um, in the context of antimicrobial resistance. So I'm, I'm super briefly going to mention that, but um, we can talk about that more um, at the end. There we go. OK. It just takes yep. a second. So um, <laughs> uh, just um, like Lauren, I'll give a brief overview um, on the top. These are the core leadership um, folks in our wastewater surveillance effort in um, the city of Chicago and across the state of Illinois. And on the bottom, I have some of our um, very important lab folks who work in my lab. Um, this is a big collaborative project that involves um, uh, some folks uh, at um, the Discovery Partners Institute, I'm at UIC, um, Argonne National Lab, Northwestern, and then close partnerships with the um, city and state departments of public health, as well as lots of other uh, cooperating entities. So um, we uh, have been working on this since 20, well, end of 2020. Um, we started in um, 2020 in Chicago and, um, and and then in 2021 expanded across the state. And so um, we, we have um, in Illinois um, across the state, we've done pilot programs in K through 12 schools. Um, so I was really um, excited to, to know about um, Houston's work. We've, we've spoken to Houston a lot um, when we were developing that pilot. And um, in Chicago, we have uh, a couple of sub, um, sub sewer sheds. So uh, manhole sites across the city that were selected based on um, vulnerability indices. And then we have facilities um, uh, we sample at um, Cook County Jail and um, O'Hare Airport. And uh, so we, we've, um, we, we have a couple of different institutional sites. And so super briefly, just, um, just to let you know, and when we get to discussion, I can, we can talk about um, this a little more if it's uh, of interest to folks, but this is uh, work that um, I was funded on from CDC to, uh, to look at antimicrobial resistance. Um, we call it SMART, sewer-based monitoring for antimicrobial resistance trends in healthcare facilities. And so this is a joint project with um, UIC and, and Rush funded by the, the um, CDC. And the idea is to develop um, wastewater methods that are specific to healthcare facilities um, and do this really intensively in the first year. So we, um, the first year will be up this November, so in a couple months, um, and really intensively uh, sample at one healthcare facility and do a lot of experimentation with how samples are collected, how they're transported, how they're um, extracted, and, um, and then with some limited point prevalence surveys that happen at the the facility and um and then going forward years two to four it's to expand to to additional facilities um do sampling uh slightly less frequently um and also uh couple the data with point prevalence surveys so the the hope is that at the end there'll be a, a really good descriptive method for how um wastewater can be used in place of these really labor intensive and expensive um clinical surveys and so the focus is on um carbapenem, carbapenem resistance and um and candida auris um, but what, so it's been a little longer than I wanted to on, on that, but, uh, the, the, um, main part that I've been asked to talk about is the Sentinel surveillance at the airport. And so this is work that we've been doing with O'Hare um, Airport and in, in cooperation with the Chicago Department of Aviation. So it's really nice about the work that we do in Chicago is we have a great working relationship with the city and the airport is um, run by a city agency. And so pretty early in the pandemic, um, we approached them 
um, through the city and uh, the plumbers there do a lot of the work for us and they are fantastic um, and they've helped identify sites. And so initially until 2022, we were sampling twice a week at two locations in the airport. One that uh, the plumbing staff and the facilities folks at O'Hare had identified as um, targeting the domestic terminal and um, the domestic terminals and one that was exclusive to the international terminals. And we were sampling twice a week. And what we found is that when we were reporting data to the um, to the uh, public health agencies, they were we, we they were weren't particularly interested in the distinction between the domestic and international terminals and we'd end up um, lumping them together and, and talking about O'Hare in general. And so um, in 2022, we really we switched to capturing one site that the, the staff there had identified um, that uh, captures the airport, including ground crew. And we um, only sample once a week. We uh, run our assays on currently on SARS-CoV-2 influenza and RSV, but um, we've been asked uh, and, and done work with MPOX when, um, when that was a, a a larger concern here as as um, as a sentinel site. So I just wanted to show this. This is from uh, well over a year ago, <laughs> two years ago maybe. Um, but what we were, were initially doing was we would uh, look at the trends in the PCR data, and we'd um, like we would like we did with our um, with a lot of our other wastewater data. We looked at um, changes over two weeks and changes over four weeks, and and um, we'd report the trend whether. Uh, cases were going up or down or likely to go up or likely to go down. And we found that um, at O'Hare, it wasn't particularly informative to look at the trends, like what what um, uh, disease levels are or, or uh, potential viral levels are at the airport because it's not the same group of people that you're measuring. And we don't, there's a lot of limitations to the, to um, airport surveillance. And, and so just looking at trends, um, didn't seem really a, as relevant um, at the airport as it would um, in, in other sites. So we now report just a risk level, and because um, we're we're uh, and, and so that we have different um, risk matrices that we use for different um, sites, and and are calculated in different ways. But O'Hare is actually really simple, where we just look at viral levels, and we have um, threshold levels, <laughs> like how how much of the the virus we were capturing, and um, and it's reported zero, one, two or one, two, three, and four. And um, and to be honest, I think, um, you know, we, we report this weekly uh, to the to the Chicago Department of Public Health. I, I don't know how, um, I mean, we're, we're running the PCRs, so this is uh, data that we get anyway, but it really what I think the strength is for the airport is on the sequencing side. And so um, this, is, this is also old data, but um, I'll, I'll give you an example of when it, what I think is the best use of the airport as a sentinel site, and that was when Omicron first emerged, and so that's what this data is showing. Um, and at the time, um, it was not detected yet in, um, first it wasn't detected in the U.S., and then it wasn't detected in the state. And um, although this uh, airport surveillance is, um, is under the purview of the Chicago Department of Public Health. The state really thought that if anywhere um, would be the first site in, in the country or in the state to see um, Omicron, it would be at the airport. And so they uh, just in a rush to identify Omicron, um, IEPH really pushed to uh, in, um, ramp up the sequencing there. And so we collected additional samples more than twice a week and um, and sequenced, uh, tried to turn around the sequencing really quickly. We also ran PCR assays that were Omicron specific assays. And um, this was in, in our early days of sequencing too. So um, our sequence quality has improved tremendously in the time since. But what this plot shows, um, that heavy black line that's labeled ripple, 
Um, that's clinical data um, from, from nasal swabs in um, the city of Chicago that the, the Rush University runs. And they were also on this mad hunt for Omicron and found, the, uh, and so they were doing a lot of targeted sequencing. Like they'd find uh, a individual who was presenting with different um, symptoms or who had re recent travel history. And they were like, get that person, let's sequence from that person. And so they actually, um, the first Omicron in, in Chicago was identified in those ripple samples. But what's um, What's plotted is how how the proportion of um, the sequence data that's Omicron and the um, greenish it's it's a little hard to distinguish but the greenish um, lines are the the O'Hare samples and in fact um, even uh, before. Um, Omicron became abundant in the routine surveillance and clinical samples. We saw it a lot in, in O'Hare. And so I think um, th this, this was like a, a good um, use case for, uh, for this airport sentinel surveillance. But I think going forward, um, we've really been trying to push the sequencing as um, the, the um, strength of, of the airport surveillance. And so this is just from last week. And I took out all the data from the city of Chicago from uh, from all our other samples or the names, the data is there, but I took out their names except for O'Hare. And so reading this across, so now we reported it with these heat maps of all the different lineages that we sequence. And so what we can do is, is see if there's lineages, like you can follow this down um, 1.16.6 and, um, and this one uh, 1.5 5.10, which seem to be um, more abundant in O'Hare. And, um, you know, this one is, is barely present or um, absent in, in a lot of other locations in the city. And so um, the, the tricky part about the airport, too, is that um, we don't, so we're capturing travelers, but we're also capturing um, people who work there. And so I think this this um, segues well into Aaron's um, work on aircraft sampling. Um, but we're capturing, you know, anybody who goes through a hair. We're also capturing people who may be um, transferring. So <laughs> O'Hare is a major layover airport. Not everybody is getting out and um, staying in Illinois. Not everybody is getting out and staying sh in Chicago. They might um, deplane and, and go elsewhere in the state. So it's it's not really um, a signal for, for the city of Chicago necessarily, but um, it might give us um, ideas of things that, that may be coming in. And so um, the, the I'll just wrap it up. The last thing I want to say is, it, it, well, two, two the last things I want to say. One is that um, we're really interested in linking this genomics um, surveillance. This is the the entire state um, all of in wastewater um, over all time that we've been doing this. And so um, we're really interested in linking the genomic surveillance that we do at the airport to community spread and um, at the city and state scales and understanding how predictive it is. Is it predictive? Can we track um, movement of variants? Um, that we might detect in the airport. And then um, the very last thing I'll mention is that I think um, uh, there's, you know, this this uh, discussion is centered around wastewater, of course, but um, I think environmental surveillance as a whole is really important and really useful at um, airports and other travel hubs, train stations, um, you know, any, any sort of travel um, hubs. And so um, we've we've started using air samplers too. We have um, some air samplers deployed at um, at the Cook County Jail, and we had a pilot where we were looking at um, air samples on on aircraft and um, possibly even at the airport. And I think together with um, with air samples and wastewater, like a collective um, infectious disease surveillance from multiple environmental data sources can be really useful, um, especially for Sentinel sites. So I'll end there. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think you've queued up Aaron uh, perfectly by go passing off from, from airports. And um, um, certainly the work on AMR is something I think we're gonna want to discuss uh, further. It's very interested in that. Um, 
personally as well as for the committee. Um, but let's go ahead and proceed to Aaron, and then we'll have the most time for questions. Um, There's for a the question. If you want to, um, you can put it either in the chat or we can discuss it later too. Super. Yeah. So yeah, next I'd like to introduce Aaron Bivens uh, from LSU, who's going to speak to us about airplane monitoring. Aaron. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about our work, um, trying to use aircraft wastewater to surveil infectious agents. Um, let's see if I can get this slide. There we go. So of course, um, some of the earliest public health surveillance activity was associated with seaborne travel. And travel's always been associated with the movement of disease since the bubonic plagues. Um, and now, of course, our aircraft surveillance, uh, our aircraft uh, travel networks have far surpassed our seaborne ones, at least in terms of moving um, humans. And so when we think about the scale of this industry, um, prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are about uh, almost 4.7 billion people annually traveling via aircraft between different locations. And then, of course, the pandemic kind of um, depressed those numbers. But now the aircraft industry is seeing uh, air travel industry is seeing a ro robust rebound. And this is expected to only the number of people traveling by aircraft is expected to continue to rise as a um, key characteristic of our globalized world. Um, when we consider um, the scale of air travel, this uh, this map is a depiction of all the long haul flights. So flights greater than six hours um, linking the different continents and locations uh, throughout the earth with flight times, you know, anywhere from 17 hours or less. Um, and so really, when we think about incubation times for infectious diseases, um, these are very efficient conduits for moving people and their associated microorganisms um, throughout the world and almost every continent. Uh, and so when we think about these aircraft, some of the features that are of interest are that, one, they're a closed system, so they're bounded. We, we board a number of passengers. We have a manifest. Um, and anyone who uses the bathroom on board an aircraft, uh, their, their biological material is sequestered into the plumbing. And so the question that emerged was, can we use data from aircraft wastewater uh, to provide public health intelligence? So, of course, one of the first things we're confronted with is do, especially if we consider a fecal um, shed pathogen, is do people actually defecate on planes? Um, there's really only one study on this, uh, and this, this is self-report data, so I guess we have to probably hold it uh, lightly. But for short-haul flights, uh, maybe around a 13%, quote, likelihood to defecate. Uh, for long-haul flights, 36%, which is certainly higher than I would have, I would have guessed. Um, but there's certainly reasons to be skeptical about self-report data um, from a survey. But that's kind of what we have for now. Um, now, of course, once someone uh, defecates on board an aircraft, um, that material is sequestered into a waste tank. And so this aircraft wastewater, actually for a couple of reasons, is an ideal surveillance matrix. First of all, this these vacuum toilets, I'm sure we've all heard them. Um, they flush this fluid at somewhere close to 300 miles an hour because of the vacuum, the pressure differential between the inside and outside of the aircraft. So, of course, this material is pretty well mixed by the time it reaches the waste storage tank. And then um, for fuel efficiency, we don't want to transport a lot of water. So usually it's highly concentrated with two to 300 mils of fluid per toilet flush. And so, of course, a highly concentrated matrix could be good for trying to detect something that's rare, assuming we can overcome uh, analytical difficulties like inhibition. Now, once these aircraft land, of course, they need to be serviced. So all that uh, waste that we've sequestered in the tanks needs to be pumped out and reset for the next flight. And it turns out that this is actually an opportune moment to collect a wastewater sample. Um, not what I'm told is not every flight is serviced necessarily, but my guess is most long haul flights are serviced. 
Um, and so there have been a couple of devices invented that connect to the aircraft here, and we're able to siphon off some of this wastewater as it's being pumped out of the aircraft. Um, the collection logistics are, are have to be carefully coordinated. Of course, these ramp areas um, are restricted areas and they're restricted to authorized personnel. The only people that are authorized to touch the aircraft are the ground handlers. And so we need to coordinate with the airlines, the airport authorities, terminal operators, and ground service com uh, ground servicing companies um, for these efforts. And I think that's actually potentially one of the strengths here is that really to do this, you you have to have the government public health agency in, in the front leading the effort. Um, it's really hard to negotiate all these things um, in the absence of a public health agency on the team and leading the effort. That's been the case here in the U.S. Um, so I think that's a strength of this approach. Um, this idea really isn't a new idea. Um, we, one of the first studies, uh, at least in terms of public health surveillance, is from 2015. Um, a team in Denmark did some shotgun sequencing of wastewater from 18 flights for antibiotic resistance genes. And they proposed this as a, as a new paradigm for pathogen surveillance in their paper in 2015. Um, we saw another study in Germany in 2019, again, ARGs 2019, also in Denmark, looking at virus uh, community composition in aircraft wastewater. And what's interesting is in, in, um, in this study in Germany, when we consider the, uh, this is the number of, uh, drug resistance uh, exhibited by the isolate. So this these isolates are resistant to three different antibiotic compounds. And we see that aircraft uh, exert, uh, displayed a unique signal relative to the uh, municipal treatment plant and then um, the municipal treatment plants without uh, receiving any uh, effluent from airport terminals. So we see a unique signal here. Same thing in 2019, when we look at the viral community and flights originating from South Asia versus North Asia and uh, North America, we see unique geographically associated uh, signal in these samples. So with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the idea was, you know, can we look for SARS-CoV-2 RNA in these aircraft wastewater samples? So we began with just a very small N of three we tried a couple different concentration methods, five different assays, and we were able to detect um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA, although it was at very low uh, concentrations, 400 to 300 gene copies. Um, probably more, one of the more interesting observations here too is that we did some, we seeded some uh, of the disinfectant blue juice uh, with this RNA, and we were found that the signal was persistent out to 48 hours, which we considered like a reasonable um, handling time for aircraft wastewater. Uh, in a follow-on study to that, we took uh, collected wastewater from 37 international uh, repatriation flights into Australia. These are about 6,500 passengers. At that time, Australia had a mandatory quarantine, so all these passengers went into quarantine. During that time, there were 112 incident COVID-19 cases among these passengers. Um, and we found that the aircraft wastewater was actually predictive uh, for 84% of these incident cases during uh, quarantine, which is I considered pretty pretty promising. There's a couple other interesting observations from this study I want to point out. Um, first, rinsate samples. So we in 28 uh, in 28 uh, cases. We were able to collect rinsate after the tank was serviced, and in two of those samples, they were positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA, although it was at much lower concentration than our uh, hot samples, but it's clear that we we're probably going to need some sort of cutoff values uh, for this. Another really interesting uh, observation to me is that we had eight aircraft with only a single COVID-19 case on board, and for six of these eight, the wastewater samples were positive. So that's 75% positivity compared to a 36% likelihood to defecate from, from Jones et al., which I think is suggestive. Uh, if we think about this as like a Bernoulli trial, given a probability of 36% for someone to defecate, the probability of observing six of eight flights positive is about two and a half percent. So this is a low probability of event that we had during this study. 
Um, in another study, we were able to detect an Omicron infection. So there were 12 flights arriving to Australia. One of them was arriving from Johannesburg. We were test screening with RT-QPCR, and we found actually a sample with the deletion 6970, which is a signature of Omicron. We took that sample and sequenced it with uh, two different protocols, and ultimately we were able to detect 63 of the 72 defining mutations for Omicron. And turns out there was a passenger on board this flight uh, infected with the Omicron uh, variant. What's really interesting is this flight landed in Darwin the same day that Omicron was declared a variant of concern by the WHO. So it kind of demonstrates just how, how quickly and efficiently these microorganisms are able to uh, diffuse via these travel networks. This work has been replicated elsewhere. So Dubai, um, close to 200 flights. France. Uh, interestingly, in France, there were two flights that arrived and were positive, had positive wastewater results. And then they were actually able, they, they used a rapid screen, and then they were actually able to uh, test the passengers and found 20% positivity for Omicron BA1. And the sequencing of the wastewater and the passenger uh, samples aligned fairly well. Uh, the UK more recently had 93% positivity among 32 flights. And here in the U.S. at JFK, 81% um, positivity, and then of those samples, 32% yielded Omicron sublineage genomes. And these um, genomes tend to, tended to agree fairly well with what we know was happening um, in the countries of origin at that time. We've started looking for some other microorganisms, including pathogens. Uh, we've done a small pilot study with just 24 samples, and we've been able to find, you know, crassphage, of course, uh, human polyoma, rhinovirus A and B, uh, norovirus, influenza. So you can see there's a, a variety of infectious agents we've been able to detect in these samples. Um, a few th things that we were, uh, were non-detect, but overall promising results. We did a bit of modeling, uh, just a very simple Monte Carlo model to estimate how many flights would we need to uh, sample if we wanted to collect material from uh, roughly 10% of all international arriving passengers. And we, we considered two scenarios. One, let's assume there's only shedding by the fecal route. Two, let's consider the possibility that some of this material is actually in urine. Um, and so our participation rate in this model is about 36% of passengers, and here it's 75 to 100%. And you can see that across the 10 airports that receive the most international arrivals, we would need to sample anywhere from 200 to 40 flights per week for a fecal shed pathogen, or 60 to roughly 20 per week in the case of a urine shed pathogen, uh, mainly because those participation rates are so different in the sample. Of course, that's like a general purpose uh, bioradar, as it's being described. There's also the possibility that you could couple this approach with um, some network modeling in order to target specific nodes in the air transport network. This could be done for like a general purpose surveillance system, or we could um, actually, in response to the emergence of outbreaks, uh, use these network models. This is GleamViz, which is an, uh, a web-based application um, and based on the characteristics of the disease, we could actually target some nodes. The other thing we could consider is places where there's not as much uh, clinical surveillance. Of course, we can design the aircraft wastewater surveillance system to maybe provide better coverage from those areas. There's a lot of important questions that are still outstanding, probably more questions than answers. Uh, how many passengers actually contribute to this sample? Uh, the residual contamination in the waste tanks is certainly, you know, our sample size there is still only 28. Uh, what other analytical techniques could we apply? So you think about if our interest is primarily sequencing, one thing we could do is um, screen with a rapid method, such as an RT lamp and then use that to, uh, to screen our samples and get them into sequencing faster. There's always the question of what other pathogens, um, how do we interpret and apply the data in real time, and then how do we integrate into public health decision-making? I think Dr. Friedman is speaking later and can probably add some more here. Um, a couple of key takeaways uh, from my experience so far with aircraft wastewater surveillance is that the, the data can provide geographically resolved insights. 
Um, SARS-CoV-2 can be readily detected and sequenced from aircraft wastewater, and we've had pretty, pretty good success detecting some other pathogens as, as well. Um, importantly, the aircraft wastewater signal does seem to be predictive of incident COVID-19 among passengers, um, which means that in, if you imagine some future pandemic, um, you could potentially notify passengers and advise them to seek testing based on your aircraft wastewater results. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it off here. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, thank all of our speakers. Let's go ahead and open it up to to questions. And I'd like to start um, with the committee um, because they have to write the report. So uh, give them preference in, in asking uh, questions. Go ahead and raise your hand. Hopefully I can see those. If not, Stephanie, if you can see them, call them out. So Chuck has raised his hand. Yeah, just a question on, on the Houston school data. Um, so I don't know what the Houston school uh, district is like. Is there a lot of student transportation from different zip codes to the zip code of the school? Sorry, I'm just trying to get my mic working. Yeah, um, I... Uh, I think that definitely does occur. I'm not sure how much it occurs at these specific schools, so I'd have to look into that. I don't know if Lauren Hopkins is on here. She might know the answer to this, but I think it's very uh, school dependent in terms of the amount of um, transportation that's happening at a specific school and how many people are coming in from outside zip codes. I mean, looking looking at the uh, temporal correlations of adjacent schools, I think would be fascinating. And I think I'd strongly encourage you to try to get your arms around that data. Yes, uh, I think that's a great suggestion. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'm hopeful it's, it will yield something interesting. I think in general, we do see like a lot of sample variability for these facility level samples that make yeah. some of these correlations really challenging to establish. Uh, and so uh, while I'm hopeful we'll get something from that, I, I don't know if other folks, this is about facility level sampling, but in general, we see, you know, a lot of um, sample variability, much, much more at the facility level than we'll see at um, like a wastewater treatment plant. All right, Scott. Thank you, sorry. I had a question for both Aaron and Rachel. Um, and it's this idea that because the populations in the airports are so transitory, um, you've already kind of indicated that following trends is an issue. But I'm curious just to what even the risk levels, what value they have, and how broad a geographic area you think should be responsive to that risk level. And then kind of couple that with a question regarding the timing of these analyses. Because um, the idea of sampling every flight as it comes in, if we can get the results by the time that people leave, that's great. But uh, you know the, the dollars for public health follow-up on every passenger is is significant so just from a utility standpoint how, how does that reconcile your thinking i think it's more about seeing uh, at least i i'll speak for the airport um surveillance i think it's more about spotting something there before it's it's seen elsewhere and so it's not even like risk level so much as like alerting, I, I think if it's used right, which at this, at, at the moment, I don't think it's used to its potential in, in Chicago um, or in the state, but I think ideally it would, it could trigger, you know, we see some, a, a new, whether it's a new SARS-CoV-2 variant or a new, um, a new pathogen or, or something that's just not seen elsewhere, we can alert, um, uh, trigger some sort of action to to um, keep an eye out for it elsewhere. So a lot of the response to to detecting things like MPOX is, um, you know, heads up to clinicians if somebody presents with a, a nasty rash, you know, don't don't write it off as eczema. There's MPOX was detected. Um, so I, I I don't I don't view it so much as a, a risk, but as a way to inform 
what's there, which I think was was being used for even the the passenger the traveler surveillance program that the CDC runs, um, sequencing individuals at airports, just giving a sense of what's what's there and what could be coming from elsewhere. Gotcha. So just as follow up, are you then looking for NEPA right now? Uh, am I looking for what now? NEPA? There's no. Breaking no. Corolla right now. No, wait, no. <laughs> Aaron, thanks for your response in the chat. Yeah, I think I, I just responded to Chuck about the CSTR. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of this depends on how quickly we're able to produce the results. Um, and then, of course, I guess I think of like, don't let good be the enemy of perfect or let, don't like, uh, I can't remember the the saying, but you, you get what I mean. If we can, if we can interrupt some of these transmission chains, uh, that would be helpful. So in my, in my mind, right, you have this manifest of people, you know, who is on the flight, you have their contact information um, in the event of maybe for like the flu or something, it's not as useful, but for a, for a pandemic, especially early onset, um, you could potentially follow up and encourage people to seek testing or to maybe consider quarantining themselves. Um, so I do think there are some direct actions you can take. Um, but of course, with all surveillance systems, right, the more rare this event is, the harder it's going to be to detect, especially when you're trying to be resource efficient in your screening. So there's just a lot of tension between, <laughs> between these two uh, purposes. So Thank you. Mark, did you want to respond to that too? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it's basically just kind of expanding a little bit on on where Aaron was finishing up, which is I perfect I completely agree. The perfect should not be the enemy of the good. We are you can well, how are you? Yep, I got yep. No, don't worry. <laughs> Say that to my students all the time. Um with the yeah, what are the but the the other piece to that is what are the levers that you even have control over? Like what are your levers of control? And so if you don't have levers of control, it's data for the sake of data. If you do have levers of control, then you have data that's useful for figuring out which lever to pull or what combination of them to pull, things like that. Now, like collecting the data to be able to say what levers do we need to envision we need to have in place, that's another really interesting interesting approach. I think, again, if you can narrow down those time frames to be able to get from sample to result, and you already have those algorithms in place to be able to run the computation, then I think you're at that next stage of trying to prevent the next pandemic. I think one question I'm kind of wrestling with in, in, in all of this is like, can we pull and will we pull are two different things. Um, and there's a lot of beyond the science, there's a lot of forces at play in how this data get used. Um, and that's the part that for me, it's kind of hard to know, right? Like how confident you need, do you need to be, um, how much research do you need to have the confidence to like have confidence that if you pull the lever, you're not doing, you know, you're making a good decision. I, I think that depends on the size of the lever. I know if it's, if it's, uh, if you're going to, like in, in your case, is there a lever, is there ever going to be a lever where you shut down Charles de Gaulle Airport because of what you found on X number of flights? Right? If that lever is ever going to exist, that needs, that needs a lot in order to pull that. Um, if it's now going to be, smaller order like it's like the stages that we go through for odrc some of those initial stages are almost nothing the offenders don't even notice that they're happening but they're there um you know the correctional officers are so used to it at this point that they don't even really notice it which has an opposite danger the more routine something gets the more likely you're making an error during it right so the, again you gotta balance all these things but i think it really comes down to is how big is that lever that you're going to pull and then that tells you a little bit more about weight of evidence thank you half of my question is already been answered um but uh, i have a question for rachel um can you share some more uh, detail about your sampling strategy 
uh, like how did you determine the frequency of sampling at the airport? You're on mute. I realize that. Um, <laughs> Took me a second. Um, I was actually going to say something on that um, to the to the last question and Scott's point about um, sampling frequent. I think sampling frequency is is kind of critical in at least in interpreting the data because, like like you all said, you're not going to sample every single flight, and we're not going to sample you know every every day like we're resource everybody's resource limited right and so what I, I think it's an important question what amount of what frequency um is useful and what um what kind of assumptions or uncertainties are there given a certain sampling frequency so if something's very low abundance and there was a, a passenger on one flight that was not the one that you sampled or it came through the airport the day before you, you sampled, you're not going to catch that. Um, so, you know, it, I, I think um, it's a long winded way of saying, you know, we, we came up on um, for SARS-CoV-2 one week uh, sampling once a week um, was sufficient for getting a picture of what, um, what, COVID variants were present, but is it the right frequency for other pathogens? Is it the right frequency for, um, you know, if you wanted to do risk level or anything like that, I, I don't know, but for, um, to get a picture of, of, uh, variants and, and at the rate that we turn over data, um, we, we would get another sample a week later if we missed it the first week. And, and so that's how we came up on that, so both resources and our goal. Sandra. Yeah, I have a question about the active kind of auto samplers versus the passive sampling. And I know Rachel, you're actively working on that. And Mark, you mentioned it. Um, in this report, we're gonna try and address a lot about trade-offs and cost versus the quality of the data, I'm sure is going to be a common theme. Do you have any sense on where the passive sampling is going to benchmark against what I would think is more the gold standard, the auto samplers, or when we'll know that answer? Is that a year out, six months out? It depends so much on the target too. And there's so many trade-offs, like with one method, our samples are dirtier and with one method. And, and actually right now, I didn't say this, but um, right now we're doing grab samples at the airport, which is like not the ideal sampling method, but the plumbers at the, the O'Hare plumbers are the ones who are collecting the samples for us. And we gave them auto samplers and they didn't want to fuss with they we tried it we placed them um they had to charge the battery and they rigged up thing and they were like this is this no <laughs> and and because they're they're volunteering and they're doing this they're doing a favor for us um we we compromised um, so, you know, not just like the, the gold standard for, for the type of sample you get, but depending on who's sampling, Lauren was mentioning, um, who samples for the school projects. And, and I, I think you all are very lucky that your health department has, has hired people to do that, but it really depends on the site and, and who's doing the sampling and what they're willing to do for you. So that, that needs to be a consideration too. Sometimes the best method for for data isn't the best for logistics. Um, so, so one of the the other pieces, there's a couple other pieces to that. One is a lot of the a lot of the methods that are like decision analysis models or or uh, risk models that these that these data are streaming into are expecting quantitative data, and the passive samplers will give you effectively presence absence. You know, the ones that I have familiarity with. So um, you can still run that through and you can still get a quantitative result from it, uh, but it would be, it is a little bit more challenging. Um, the other piece to that is that that's not all for for loss as well. So if you do move over to something that gives you some, get, gives you results that are more aligned with presence absence, then there's a threshold at which the presence absence occurs. So you can do 
you can do methods along those lines. So you know, we're working on something similar in food safety right now with presence absence data, where it's it's not it's not the best, but it would still be something that you can use. And you can look to see how frequently you get a different hit. So the, the basis there where we're looking right now with regards to using the passive samplers is the frequency of hits. So you can actually get more of those into the system along the 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 sewer line, depending on where your access points are. So you can actually look at the transport. So you look, you can look to see whether or not dispersion is really that big of a problem, depending on the size of your sewer. So like if you're monitoring something that's going into a very large sewer pipe, you might need to account for dispersion or uptake into biosolids or something else where you're losing the signal along the way. And passive samplers look like they might be able to do do pretty well with that to be able to, to get a better idea of how complex does the bait and transport consideration need to be with regards to that. So there's some really interesting questions that the the passives can can get at. The other aspect of it is that once we can build up the computational methods to be able to use those just as effectively as the auto samplers, because they are so much epically cheaper and easier to place, and you don't have to worry about battery and you don't have to worry about cooling and you don't have to worry about all these different things, um, there would be a lot better by way of where we can get them spread out into different communities, how we can do targeted sampling, and then go from there. The The thing that I would come back and remind about is it, they, you know, that expansion, if it, we're going to go down that expansion route at all, then again, it would, it needs to kind of come back to what do we know about the community? What's the effect size that we're trying to monitor for and properly power it so that we're getting representative samples uh, for whatever group it is that we're monitoring. We've been using some uh, passive samplers here. We have a lot of rural treatment plants in Louisiana that have no resources um, if you do the math in the National Wastewater Surveillance System, if you're served by a small treatment plant, you're about 12 times less likely to be included in the system. Um, so we've been chunking in some passive samplers with activated carbon um, on the hunt for some different pathogens, and they've been extremely easy for us to deploy. Mm -hmm. We're also experimenting with waste uh, surface waters that are receiving uh, on-site sewage system effluent as a way of like, hey, can we look in surface waters uh, and and see any trends there for these people that are on decentralized uh, sewers? So I think passive sampling is really promising. Um, a lot of questions still to be answered. All right, Scott, last question before break. Sorry, struggling with unmute for some reason. Um, mine goes to that question of passive sampling. So are your, you currently using the passive samplers as just plus minus, benchmarking them based on the time deployed, or have you actually done the absorption isotherms? And if so, are you doing absorption isotherms in the different water systems to understand the matrix effect? We use them, uh, we use them um, passive samplers across the city. Um, but Aaron's done a lot of work or some work on on calculating the the dynamics of passive samplers. And I think it it depends on the material and the flow. And <clears throat> that has to be benchmarked for every unique site or or not. But our our logic is if we're doing it at the same place that it um that it's there's consistency there so we could compare those samples to to the same sample to different samples from the same site but you haven't validated the recoveries or aren't benchmarking against time um, i mean we've looked at recoveries but not we haven't done the experimentation i think that takes like lab scale reactors to to look at flow and adsorption and and things like that and that that we haven't done but I think actually with the antimicrobial resistance project that we're doing at the, the facility, um, 
we're going to have clinical, really tight clinical data to line that up to. And we're doing, we're taking, uh, we have an auto sampler on site, we're taking grab samples, and we're doing passive sampling. And we have the point prevalence surveys and, and other um, data. So I think in that, for that location, we'll be able to to get some some good answers on on benchmarking. We're kind of treating them as like a TSS sampler. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do right now in the lab is uh, characterize TSS isotherms and kinetics. And we'll see. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we're learning a lot of hard lessons right now. We just started these experiments and it's like, there's a lot more than I would have guessed <laughs> involved. All right. Uh, uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, all our speakers again. Um, obviously, you're welcome. Um, and and uh, it would be great if you could join us for the second part, because we're going to be addressing some of these uh, same issues, uh, if your schedules will permit. We're going to take a break until a quarter till, and then we will reconvene. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I think we need to put up our slides again. Um, I think our, our next speaker, we're delighted to have Cindy Friedman uh, with us from the CDC, who's going to talk about uh, kind of following on the theme of this morning, um, airport monitoring uh, plans from a CDC perspective. So Cindy, if you're ready. Yeah, I'm here. I can share my slides if you're ready. Can you hear me okay? I can, perfectly. Okay, great. Let me just... Uh... Get the screen two up. Uh, screen two, share, and let me make this. Okay, are you seeing the yep. full slide? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay, great. So thanks for inviting me to talk to you. Um, let's see, oh, I just have some pop up here. One second. Okay, there we go. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about multimodal surveillance in the global transportation network, um, specifically CDC's Traveler-Based Genomic Surveillance Program, or TGS. Um, I Let's just get started. You asked me two questions today. What is the current status and plans for airport monitoring of infectious diseases? And how does airport monitoring fit into news and the broader CDC strategy for detecting and managing the spread of emerging infectious diseases? And hopefully when I finish um, today, we'll have answered those questions, but I'm happy to take any additional questions. And I have about 15 slides. Um, so I'll just start off with the traveler-based genomic surveillance platform which plays an important role in US national biosurveillance. Um, the program was started back in September, 2021 as a proof of concept project. Uh, it's a public private partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks and Express Check. And basically um, we partnered with an air, airline spa, airport spa group who was doing testing um, for uh, outgoing passengers. They converted their spa company because of the pandemic into a testing company. And we heard them give a talk and thought, could we um, partner with them? Because we were sort of behind on every variant that was coming into the country when Alpha emerged, when um, some of the other ones emerged. And this was at the, around the time of Delta. And so we put together a program um, and we didn't know if it was going to work, but it was um, operating at the time in three airports and it was testing volunteer international travelers by having them self-collect nasal swabs at the airport anonymously uh, and answer a few demographic and clinical questions. And uh, the pilot was a success. We enrolled, uh, we have enrolled over 323,000 volunteer travelers. We're currently at six airports. We've been at seven, we've been at four. Right now we, we're at six. And during the last year, about a year ago or more, we thought that, you know, how long are travelers going to continue to volunteer to give us a sample? They don't get anything in return except a free take home antigen test. And at times that's been really valuable when test supplies were limited. 
Um, most people say they participate because they want to do something and feel like they're helping um, the community and public health. But we didn't know if that was going to last. And we wanted to look at other avenues to potentially um, get the similar data from arriving international travelers. And travelers are good because they get and spread infectious diseases quickly and give us a clue as to what's happening across the globe. So we started a pilot and we've um, continued that pilot into a program of collecting airport and aircraft wastewater samples. And I'll, I'll go into the details of that. And that's the obviously the focus of my talk today. Um, just some other um, information about the program. It has two goals. Uh, they er enhance early detection of new variants. And also we've been able to really fill gaps in global surveillance, especially recently where we're seeing a 90% decline in testing and sequencing globally. We've really been able to fill in those gaps using the traveler as a sentinel. Um, and the other big piece of um, valuable information is that our results are reported within eight to 10 days of collection. So pretty near real time and, and quick. We reach travelers on many flights um, from over 135 countries. And we've been one of the top three contributors to GISAID for US submissions for the last several months. Um, and, and so I'll just review the three parts of the program. So I've, I've just told you a little bit about the traveler nasal sampling program, which we're not gonna talk about today. And then that we started the airplane wastewater sampling program last summer in 22 as a pilot and then expanded to broader implementation. And I'll go into the details, but wastewater is collected as part of routine laboratory servicing of aircraft on arrival using a custom made collection device. Um, and we, uh, it, this provides samples without direct traveler involvement. And we can still get the country of origin of the flight. And then more recently, we've started looking at airport triturator drain sampling as another modality in our program. Um, where, and I'll go into some of that as um, later on. So I think I'm probably pe preaching to the choir already. I don't know. I Sorry I missed this morning session, but I had another talk and I just got back at noon. So I caught the last little bit. But just in case, I'll just review quickly. We go from more granular uh, information when we sample directly from the aircraft when it arrives at the airport. Uh, the next step would be the laboratory truck um, that drains the, the wastewater from the plane, which then dumps their wa the waste in a triturator. Different airports have different numbers of triturators. Some ha are lucky enough to have like an international only triturator and a domestic triturator. That's helpful. And then there's the terminal and then the wastewater treatment plant. So we go from more granular to less. So let's start with the aircraft piece. And this is our workflow um, for the samples are collected. Um, they're at the, at, at the airplane, they're sent to the lab for PCR. Positives are sequenced and then the samples um, are tested and sequenced um, and results are uh, available within eight days. Uh, for the pilot, uh, this is a picture of the device, the collection device, which is an end-to-end -end collection system that attaches to the, both the plane and the, the hose that uh, attaches to the plane. So the this yellow pit bit would attach to the plane, the hose would attach here. And, oh, I'm not showing you. The yellow bit, the hose would attach here. And then this is our sample collection bottle. Uh, which is a half a liter with a spigot. And so there's usually three or four tanks on a plane and um, we get a sample from each of the tanks. We think that there's good mixing because of the turbulence during the flight so that there's not an issue that the sample isn't well mixed. Uh, there's a new version of this, uh, this device being developed by Ginkgo that um, doesn't involve unscrewing the bottle that really is uh, really a seamless um, sort of like venipuncture type device. Um, and so for this pilot last summer at JFK, we 
successfully collected uh, wastewater from 88 flights. Uh, there was no disruption to the ground handlers. There were no accidents. Uh, there were no really no issues. It adds like less than five minutes to operations, probably about three. Uh, we've detected SARS-CoV-2 in 65 out of 80 uh, samples that, and we those were tested positive by PCR, so 81%. Uh, we were able to identify genomes in about 40%, and these were consistent. So we've selected flights from three countries, Netherlands, France, and I believe it was the UK. And the, the genomes that we identified were uploaded to KISAID, and at the time, the circulating variant in Europe was BA5, and 90% of our lineages were BA5. So we were finding what was out there. So this was a eight week pilot. Um, then we decided to take a look um, at wastewater sampling at the triturator level at the airport, um, because one of the challenges, which I'll go into a little bit later, is getting airlines to agree to allow their waste to be sampled. So you need to have the airlines on board, then you need to train the ground handlers and work with them. Not every airline uses this same ground handling company. There are many of them and many different permutations at different airports. So, uh, you know, an airline could use one ground handler at Dulles Airport and a different ground handler at San Francisco. So a lot of moving parts. And then the airport has to be um, also on board. So with the tr triturator, I heard you guys talking about auto samplers. We, there's the triturator drain. We, we started in San Francisco this spring. Um, and this is the triturator on the top. And the, um, the auto sampler is over here. The, the, the hose from the lav truck attaches and then the sample, it's triggered by flow and we get a daily sample from the triturator. And in San Francisco, they have an international triturator. So mostly it's international flights, um, but occasionally a domestic flight could be put on the, it, uh, on the side of the airport where that triturator is. And so there could be mixing. And so you don't get that level of specificity of knowing which flight you're getting a result from. Um, so this is where we are in the current collections. Um, we have the aircraft wastewater. Um, most recently, we've collected that since the spring about 126 samples with, it, again, an 81% positivity. We get consistently about 40, 43% return lineages. But the interesting piece here is that 73% of those aircraft wastewater samples only yield one lineage. Um, and these are some of the lineages we've found, which are the current circulating lineages. But the triturator, um, we have you know, high positivity there, but actually we get many lineages detected. So whereas we got 73% with one lineage, we only get about 10% with one lineage. We get 90% have multiple lineages detected. And that makes sense. You know, it's a lot of different airplanes dumping into this sample. And these are the lineages um, that we have found. So I, there are limitations of both aircraft wastewater and traveler-based surveillance, and that makes them really complementary approaches at this point in time. We don't think that one could supplant the other right now. Um, for the traveler side, not all travelers participate. It's a voluntary program. Um, if we had more hubs in international uh, airports, that would help improve the scope of the program because we, we wanna get a broad uh, depth of coverage. So Africa, Asia, all the different parts of the globe, places where people aren't reporting what variants they're seeing or even testing or sequencing. Um, and then sampling in individual travelers can be more resource intensive. We use a pooled sampling approach. So we group them in, in uh, pools of 10. And so if the pool's negative, the, we don't test any further, but if the pool's positive, then we go on and sequence, test and sequence each individual in the pool. So that helps defray some of the uh, cost. On the 
wastewater side, um, I think you're all familiar with the, there's a paper by Davy Jones from the UK and um, not all travelers use the lavatory on flights. And he did a study looking at this, showing that the chance of defecation was about 36% on long haul flights over six hours. And that's the other piece. You really need to do this on longer flights. Short flights aren't going to yield as much. Um, and not all travelers originate in the place where the flight originated. So you could have a traveler coming from the South Asia, going through London Heathrow and then to JFK. So when we're getting the sample from that Heathrow JFK flight, we're getting waste, but we think it's from London, but it could be half of the plane came from South Asia. So we, we lose that granularity that we get from the traveler. And the reason we get more data from the traveler is because we ask them. They fill out a short questionnaire about where they got out of bed in the morning, where they've traveled in the last 10 days. Um, the potential for residual virus in the lavatory tanks, we've done some initial studies looking at after the tanks have been drained with and rinsed with glycol, and we haven't seen a uh, significant amount of virus in there. And we've also are doing some work um, with partners in the UK to look at round trip flights. So the same plane when it goes from, say, Dulles to Heathrow and back, you can look at what you are finding in the on the wastewater on each side, and they shouldn't be the same if the if it was sufficiently cleaned. So what are our current focus areas and future plans? We're enrolling new airlines as we speak. We're, we have several that are set to join this month. This has been the most challenging piece, I think, for me, um, convincing the airlines to let us do this. So we're really excited that we have new partners coming on board. Um, we're expanding the sampling source. We'll probably be adding more triturators at, at different airports. Um, at additional US airports. We're initiating multi-pathogen detection and we're doing this in alignment with um, the way NEWS is doing their multi-pathogen detection. So we're uh, specifically including many respiratory pathogens, but the three of interest for the fall respiratory season are SARS-CoV-2, flu A and B, and RSV. And we're also building these global partnerships. I mentioned the UK. We're partnering with UKHSA and New Zealand and several other partners to do these global um, uh, projects where we collect airplane wastewater on both sides of a route and share data. And I think this is a good model for the global community at large. So this is some of the multi-pathogen work we're doing. We're using several platforms. Um, and they're underway. Um, for the multiplex, we're using multiplex qPCR for both the nasal samples that we get. Uh, we get about 6,500 nasal samples a week um, and the wastewater samples. Um, we're doing target enrichment sequencing and we're working with the Sebeti lab at the Bro to uh, use the Carmen platform uh, targeting uh, several viruses. And where is the program going? So I just, I think one of the interesting pieces is that this is really a platform. The Traveler is the genomic surveillance platform. So, and it can be built upon in three areas, in the mode of sampling, in the pathogens that we're sampling, and even as the AMR genes, um, and the global network piece. So we're starting to pilot air sampling um, in, in a few of our airports and sequencing from the air samplers. We're partnering with University of Wisconsin for that pilot. Um, we're enhancing surveillance capacity for global migration events. Um, we've put questions on our questionnaires on the traveler side, but we can see this platform being used for mass migration and mass gatherings as a way to for early detection. Um, and we're collaborating with the EU and other partners to try to establish a global network for airplane wastewater surveillance. So aligning methods, um, data sharing, so that data can be triangulated and compared. There's some modeling work um, done by the Vespignani Group at Northeastern that has looked at, you know, uh, the having several key transportation nodes doing airplane wastewater surveillance can really increase the time to detection of an outbreak that starts at one part of the world. 
Um, so we're looking at that. There was a, a, several groups interested in that. And so I wanted to get to the, the second question, I think, how do we fit in with news and the CDC larger objectives? And TGS and news really have complementary objectives for advancing environmental surveillance. For us, traveler service sentinels for early detection and introduction of pathogens to the US. So we're really um, getting a picture of what's going on globally by using the traveler as like a FedEx package, bringing the sample to the US. Um, and that's important because, um, you know, getting the samples here, can, we can send them to the lab for further characterization. So if there's a new variant that we detect in a sample, we can get that to the lab and it can buy critical time. If you have to wait for another country to send you a sample, it's going to be late. Um, and so in, in many cases, we've picked up variants ahead of other community indicators. And I, I didn't bring all the, the data with me to this talk. A lot of it's from the nasal sampling program, um, and which we also fill in gaps in global surveillance. Um, and that's increasingly important when clinical testing and sequencing data are, are unavailable. And this complements news uh, domestic focus. Uh, the, and we can sometimes even inform them on what to look for. So if we're picking up a variant um, overseas that can help um, direct news to look for that variant in community wastewater. Um, we leverage multiple surveillance modalities and it can vary over time. So we can scale up, scale back. We're pretty nimble and, um, and depending on what the situation is, you know, some viruses are not, you know, flu virus, a segmented virus, not the best to look for serotypes in wastewater. You need the clinical sample. We did a pilot with the flu group last year, um, and we could detect flu from self-collected nasal swabs from asymptomatic travelers, and they were able to culture it in the lab. Um, and then aircraft wastewater testing is cost-effective. Uh, it's a cost-effective way to attain, obtain the biological samples in an anonymous way, but still preserving some key information, not as much as you get from the individual traveler. So we're coordinating on surveillance priorities. Um, and as I said, we detect new and emerging variants, which can inform news targeting efforts for what they're looking for in terms of variants and sequences. And we're aligning, we're aligning with them on lab methods and multi-pathogen targets and panels. Um, we definitely um, have plans for future collaborations to better understand the tr transmission from the U.S. port of entry into the community. So looking at the data from the airline, the airplane to the airport to the community would, I think, would be very valuable. Um, and then again, the complementary work we're doing with global partners um, in the transportation network for early warning system. And I, I think I've mentioned some of these unique considerations for aircraft wastewater. There's the logistics of sampling, access to collect the samples, the need for specialized uh, sampling equipment. You know, we've talked to some other countries that are doing this and the, the methods vary from scooping poop out of a drain to like opening the hose on the lav truck. And and those are less than ideal. It's, it's really nice to have a closed system to collect the sample. Um, the partners, as I mentioned, requires buy-in and acceptance from a lot of non-public health partners. Um, and it requires a lot of coordination and data sharing to really make this work uh, on a global uh, level. So that's all I have for today. I, Happy to take your questions. Just want to acknowledge all the folks that work on this from the three groups. And we, I have some resources here. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. That, that was great. Um, I actually participated. I was one of the people who gave a sample <laughs> to Seattle one time and they did. They asked me where I woke up that morning, which was Nairobi. So uh, I'm glad to be there one you. of the 350,000 or whatever. Well, I thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a burning question, but I'll put it off because I, we want to hear from from David Percy first um, on really one of the key questions, which is how does he use institutional data 
um, for public health uh, decision making, and then we'll have we'll open it up and and have sufficient time for questions for for all of the the panelists. So, Great. thank you. I'll Stephen. stop sharing. Yep, and David, I'll okay. turn it over to you. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, perfectly. All right, terrific. So first of all, I want to thank uh, the academies for inviting me today. It's an honor to speak. Uh, I also want to thank the presenters earlier today uh, for really great presentations. Uh, I also want to especially thank them because they've already discussed about half the things I was going to bring up. But uh, nevertheless, we'll uh, we'll move forward. So I'm I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk as a local uh, health authority, the you know the physician in the health department who did a lot of our public messaging. And I can't talk about institutional and sentinel sites, which is the, you know, the focus of today's uh, discussion without talking about the, you know, when we talk about the community wastewater sampling and, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the measurements that went on on a community level. And the reason for that is that we had to educate, as this was a, a you know, a new tool to be used in, in public health. And of course the pandemic brought a lot of attention to public health. And so this was an opportunity for us to educate the public uh, about what our mission is. Because I think that, you know, to some degree to public health credit, we were kind of off the radar for most people, which is really awful, but uh, certainly aren't anymore. But it was an opportunity to educate folks. And so we had to build credibility and, and I won't get into the discussion about how this all became very politicized, but we know how that became very, very difficult to operate uh, as people who are looking out for the, the greater health, of, uh, the, the benefit of the greater population when all the politics got involved. So credibility was incredibly important that we build credibility. And so in Houston, I will say that as um, Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Stadler's group embarked upon this wastewater monitoring, the, the, you know, I became very excited because I, I could sort of foresee some of the problems that we were going to have. Although I will also point out, I think all of us had the same experience that COVID uh, clearly didn't play by the rules, if you will. At every turn, uh, COVID surprised us with what it could do and made, you know, I, I now have a mantra that says, if you want to make a mistake in public health, make a prediction. Uh, and uh, so anyways, with that being the case, we needed credibility. And so as the wastewater sampling and the monitoring progressed and became very, very accurate, we learned a couple of things that we use across the community. And that was as, uh, well, the first problem we had was that, the, you know, the units of measure. So in Houston, we chose July the 6th, 2020, which is the peak of the first wave. And on that date, we had no idea what was going to come in the future, but we just picked that as a 100% value because the units of measure were, you know, 1.4 times 10 to the six, you know, virons per cubic milliliter or whatever, whatever the it was, which means absolutely nothing to anyone other than people like Dr. Stadler. So we couldn't use that. So we chose that as a hundred percent value. And we had to educate the public on what that meant. And then as we move forward, the, you know, the virus changed a little bit, right? And again, it became difficult because what we started telling people is you no longer need to pay attention to what the number is, but rather which direction the number is changing. And so that became important. But the bottom line was, is we learned that what happened in the wastewater accurately, reliably predicted what was going to happen to the positivity rate across the community. And that reliably predicted what was going to happen with hospitalizations in our local hospital community, and it was reliable and happened time after time after time, suddenly everybody in the community became focused on what's the wastewater. I got many, many calls about, you know, what's the wastewater doing? And, you know, who would have thought three, four, five years ago that anybody would have, pardon the pun, but who would have given a crap about what was going on in the wastewater? But um, suddenly, you know, reporters are calling. I got Congress members calling. I've got council members calling. I've got all kinds of people wanting to know what's going on in the wastewater. So I think that was really important to public health globally for us to become that source of information, which reliably predicted what was going to happen, to, you know, really across the community. Uh, once we had that and we started looking at institutional and sentinel sites, in particular places like jails um, and um, in, in Houston, we've got all kinds of jails. And if you're in a big city, you you probably, again, it's like most people think that, okay, they're, you know, the county or the city uh, has a jail. And I will tell you, I've learned so much about jail operations 
And it is a completely different world than what I thought it was. And I suspect uh, that you think it is. And, and Dr. Ware from uh, Ohio State, uh, you know, thank you for your presentation. But jails are incredibly complex places, especially large jails. And here in the city of Houston, we are within Harris County and the, the sheriff's office operates our big jail here. It's got a population of 10,000 people. And we were, you know, we, we were fortunate that all of the drainage from that, that large jail did come to one place outside the jail where we were able to sample uh, the wastewater. And of course, there was a lot of virus circulating in the wastewater. And we worked very closely with the medical staff in there. And they developed a, a program where they were, they started basically quarantining the new admissions and uh, observing them for, you know, as many days as they could. It was generally around seven to 10 days. It wasn't the full two week, the full 14 day incubation period. They just couldn't do that, but they were able to incubate, you know, quarantine them for a sufficient amount of time that then when people became symptomatic, they would, and they were doing testing of new admissions. And we were able to keep the, 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 uh, amount of COVID spreading within the jail at a remarkably low level. And here we are now three years later, and you can imagine a, you know, after all those years, we had eight deaths within the jail, only eight. Um, and our, and again, your jail population is, it's not all 20 year olds with, you know, a bunch of tattoos and a bad attitude. You've got, you know, people in, there in their 40s, their 50s or 60s with all kinds of medical problems that, you know, they've done all kinds of, you know, whatever sort of bad thing that they did or they were alleged to have done, they got them in, in there. But it's not it's not just young, healthy men. It's a quite varied population of people. It's predominantly male, but their health status is all over the map. And even some of the young folks have got some pretty serious health problems because they don't live a healthy lifestyle. But we were able to keep that down to only eight deaths here three years later. Uh, we also looked a lot at the schools, and we've talked a lot about schools, but in addition, we looked at nursing homes, another high-risk um, uh, population of people, and tested at individual nursing homes. And so we were able to go in. We got very aggressive here in Houston. We got very aggressive going into the nursing homes. We've got around somewhere between 250 and 300 nursing homes and the health department partnered with the fire department uh, to go in there. And one little thing about that, the reason we partnered with the fire department is when the health department shows up at a nursing home, they all panic and they become very paranoid that you're going to come in and find all kinds of citations. When the fire department comes, oh, it's the fireman again, because I'm the, also the EMS director here in the city of Houston. And our firefighters are going to every nursing home on a regular basis. And of course, you know, our, our, your local firehouse tends to go to the nursing homes nearby. And so quite honestly, the nurses that work in the nursing home know the firefighters that generally come when they call 911 for a seriously ill nursing home patient. So there's a relationship there. So when we showed up with the health department folks who they didn't know, but with a friendly face, a firefighter who they did know, we got let in and we were able to go through and, and we did a lot of proactive stuff. Uh, early on, and then we did a lot of reactive stuff, if you will, later on as we saw nursing homes. And then it came to, tr again, it was a trust issue. And the wastewater and the reliability and the accuracy of the wastewater values became that um, currency that we were able to, to bank on. Uh, and we're going to the nursing homes and let them know. And again, we, we were able to teach them how to do things. So here we are, you know, years later, at one point, there was a statistic, I think the CDC put it out, that about 40% of all deaths COVID deaths in America were coming from nursing homes. At one point, it was in November of 21, I think. And at that point in Houston, we had uh, about 15% of our deaths were coming from nursing homes. And now here we are years later, and nursing homes, I think, across the nation have done better. There are other parts of the population. But anyways, at the end of the day, I can remember that there were only eight deaths in the Harris County Jail because... It's also so it's only 8% of our deaths here in Houston were from nursing home residents, which is way below the national average. And so the point is that I, that I want to make from a practical standpoint, from a, a local a local guy who's just trying to you know do the best he can for his community, using the wastewater not only bought us the credibility and the trust that was so very, very much at risk during this pandemic, but it also became something very operational that we used not only with the jail and not only with the nursing homes, but as Dr. Stadler pointed out, we, you know, we also used it, at, uh, you know, she talked a lot about the schools, but we also used it in individual neighborhoods. And so when the, when COVID comes to 
a big population like this, it doesn't hit us all at the same time. It sort of makes its way across the city, right? And so there are there are neighborhoods that get hit worse than others. And she mentioned this. There are neighborhoods that get hurt worse than others at you know at this time. And then it can it can shift around a little. And then there were neighborhoods that always seemed to get hit really bad, and other neighborhoods didn't seem to get hit bad at, at, at all. Don't necessarily know why that was, but with wastewater, we were able to have a knowledge of that, we have visibility on that, and therefore we were then able to take public health teams, go into those neighborhoods, which are either at risk right today, or the ones that were chronically at risk, and I shouldn't say or, but both, and get our teams in there. We went door to door. We knocked on. We talked to people and tried to educate them, offered them tests, encouraged them to get vaccinated, and it became a very, very practical tool for us to use. And I think that's the the point I want to make. And I think I'm almost out of time. But the the point I want to make is is in the end, it it bought us the and I've said this a couple times now, but it really it bought us that absolutely invaluable credibility that we needed. That translated into trust that was so very much at risk. And then we use it to really get boots on the ground and in the neighborhoods and doing good things. And as a result, I think that we can we can probably reasonably say that in Houston, we saved many, many lives and certainly avoided a lot of illness and hospitalizations and days off from work because of what we learned with the wastewater. And so um, I think I had 10 minutes and I think I've talked for about 10 minutes. And so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, David. That was that was fantastic. I think I think we've all recognized on the committee that Houston has been a leader in in many ways, not only in the in the scope of what they've done, but how they've they've used and transmitted that that information. Um, let's open up for questions first um, with Cindy and and any for David, and then we can expand out to to all of the committee members to make sure we ha have uh, the opportunity. Um, I did have a question for Cindy, which was, um, you know, apart from the pathogens that you mentioned, one of the things we're looking at is is um, what kind of rare threats that are detected in other countries are now at risk for spread into the United States and obviously would perhaps be best detected um, at the airplane airport um, level. Um, but, but also the risk of of false positives. So if we start looking for Ebola um, or you know the MERS coronavirus back when it was spreading, um, you know just positive predictive value is working against you. Um, but yet that's one of the goals of this kind of structure. So so just curious in your thoughts of what how you would approach that and what kind of verification you would want to avoid. Um, you know a scare that doesn't materialize and, and compromises confidence. So, yeah. And so those are exactly the questions we've thought through or are thinking through as we do this. And, and you're, the goal of our program is early detection. But I don't think that necessarily every pathogen um, should be part of, you know, detected at the airport level. Like, for example, Ebola. Ebola is a clinical disease. And, you know, are we do we need to have like discrete detection because we're going to miss people? It's not, it's the opposite of SARS-CoV-2 where 40% of the people are transmitting it and they don't even know they have it. You know, when someone has Ebola. So, and also the consequence management. So we're in, our program TGS is really not tracking the names of the people. There's no consequence management. And so you don't really want to identify a plane with Ebola on it at JFK, because then what are you going to do? So when there is an Ebola threat, the, the, the prevention really should be done. And it has been done with our border intervention groups that go to Africa and work with the countries there to do exit screening, not entry screening, because we, we don't want to find it on this side. Obviously, nothing's perfect, but that has worked in the last several um, outbreaks we've had. So I think Ebola is kind of a weird one. And then, you know, but we, we have been, we're piloting everything with our program. We start small and we pilot it because we don't know. We've talked to the SMAs, SMEs and all the various groups at CDC when we're picking targets. And, and we don't know. We think some things we're going to just see a lot of and other things, you know, we're not going to see but we want to make sure that if we are seeing something that it's not a false positive. So um, 
so exactly what you're saying. So we're we're just starting small and looking at the data. So this isn't with a view to like jump in and it make it, it's not surveillance, right? I mean, it is surveillance, but it's a pilot project of seeing the capability of our program for these other pathogens. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, and Ebola is probably a bad example for the reasons you mentioned because of the clinical uh, manifestations. Um, but, you know, things like, you know, MERS coronavirus or the original SARS when it spread to Toronto. And, you know, would you, how those programs get implemented and what kind of safeguards you put for a positive detection, um, just things, right. you know. These are all things it. we're thinking about. <laughs> all right. I just hope you just give me the answer, but uh, it's not quite that simple. So, um, yeah, or NEPA is, right. is you know, which right. because it comes on people's mind and they say, you know, we've had these NEPA cases in India. Aren't, aren't you looking for it? And we're just right. curious about approach that. All right. Let's open it up for other questions. I don't want to hog all the questions. Don't Ami has her hand up. Yeah. Um, okay, next. Um, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, David. Those were great presentations. Um, I have two questions for Cindy. The first is, um, have you had any discussions around untargeted approaches to evaluate um, the trituration samples or the uh, wastewater samples from planes? So, you know, metagenomic sequencing. And my second question is for the data that you're already collecting, especially as it relates to wastewater from planes, what type of metadata are you collecting around like flux through the airport, how full the flights are, the demographics of people on the flight? Is, is anything like that being collected? So um, we're, for the flights, um, I'll take the second question first. So the for the airplane wastewater, uh, we know the origin of the flight and we know the airport <laughs> for the, you know, you're at the plane, you have to know what, what you're collecting the sample from, but what other things would you want? Or like who's on the plane? No. So like not doing demographics, like age distribution, how full the flight is. Um, I presume nowadays most of the flights are full. But yeah. So yeah. Most of the flights are full, but we're not, we're not doing that presently. Got it. And like flux through the airport, just because I understand that, you know, the flux through the airport, fullness of flights also changes from, um, you know, a weekly and seasonal basis, um, you know, other things like climate, et cetera, just out of curiosity. I mean, those data exist. We're not using them right now. Um, it, not to say they couldn't be used at some point, but not right now. Right. And then okay. the other was about the metagenomic approaches. So we're really taking our lead on some of this from the news group, from Amy Gerby's group on um, approaches that they're using. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we're just starting out small and then um, expanding. I know they have plans um, through like uh, August of 24, I think is when they are going to roll out some other stuff. So we're we're working with them. We meet with them monthly and try and align our methods so that we're not doing something totally different. So yeah, that's all in the future. Great, thank you. All right, Chuck, then Lauren, then Scott. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just um, you know echo a question I see Rachel put in the chat, which is of interest to me. Is anybody thinking of um, banking these samples? or potential retrospective studies if something we're not thinking of now comes up in the future? And, and we do bank samples, um, you know, obviously with banking um, samples. I, I don't know for the wastewater, and I, I need to check with the lab, you know, we bank the RNA for the nasal swab samples, but um, it's just a matter of space and how long. So we could bank things for a month or two, but you know, for years it becomes a problem. Right now we don't have that many samples, so we are saving them all. But as this program expands, that's a, a really good question. I'm I'm getting a lot out of this. I'm writing down <laughs> questions that for our own program. So I mean, that would be something to do. But I think banking is always good. If something emerges, did we miss it? You know, and the question is, what happens if a new um, pathogen emerges somewhere that we don't know, you know, we don't have a diagnostic test for. So how do we identify that? Lauren. 
Hey, uh, so my question is for Dr. Purse. Um, so we're just, if you can um, think about the facilities, you know, that we're talking, that we monitor, um, what do you think, or is there a use for doing facility monitoring for future threats? You know, we're doing nursing homes, schools, shelters, and the jail, but for public health preparedness, just things that we, you know, would eventually, um, that could show up, is, does a facility play a role in that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so the the thing that comes to mind, I think a lot of us are, are gonna be flu and RSV because they made the national news and stuff, but we have a, uh, we actually have a committee that I co-chair locally and we're trying to expand out to identify of all the things, you know, with wastewater there, as you guys know better than I do, but there, there are so many things that we can test for. What are the things that we should be testing for moving forward? And the, and I will tell you that the more you think about it, as we engage with our local infectious disease doctors and our school officials and so on and so forth, um, it becomes a really complex question. And so we're, we're struggling with that because we, we can't test. We, technically, I guess we could test for pretty much everything, but practically we can't test for everything. So what are going to be those things which are most actionable? And so we're, we're working on that right now. And once we get that question set up, we're going to we're going to start testing, you know, prospectively, certainly with the schools. And I will tell you that our experience with the school nurses and the school administrations uh, has been very positive. Uh, they have been very, very interested in 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 learning. And then, you know, and of course, once we tell a school, listen, you've got whether it be flu or measles or whatever, you can imagine if you're the school nurse and the health department goes, hey, guess what? You got a measles case. You know, of course, we're going to be excited. But if you're the school nurse, you're going to say, OK, God, what do I do with that? Right. And so a lot of a lot of uh, relationship building as we move forward. And we're having these discussions now. OK, what if we come to you with a with the mumps, it looks like you got mumps in the school or you've got whatever else it is that we're testing for. Um, same thing with the nursing homes and with homeless shelters. And again, the jail, which again is a completely different world. I will make the assumption that nobody on this call has ever been inside a jail other than as a visitor. I guarantee you, you don't wanna be there for any other reason, um, but they are incredibly complex uh, communities. And uh, when, a, when a pathogen a, a contagious pathogen is in, whether it be a school or a nursing home or a jail or another, um, you know, uh, specific place with confined residents, if you will, it is incredibly complex as to how you're going to uh, mitigate that. And so a lot of pre-planning has to go into it. And then that's what we're in the middle of now. I don't know if, if I answered your question, Dr. Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like thinking forward um, as we, you know, maybe there are things out there that we, um, that you know i mean do you see an application for things that we don't that we're not looking for yeah 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 so right right so um my one this is where my naivete comes in so let's say just to talk about COVID. let's say we get another we don't get you know genetic uh drift we get a big genetic shift right um are you guys gonna be able to pick that up right I, do you know what to look for in the wastewater or let's say i don't know i mean you know when I was in med school, the idea of there being an Ebola outbreak was completely off the radar, right? So these rare um, viruses, are we going to be able to pick those up? Do you know, I mean, I don't know the science of it well enough, but my understanding from you guys is that, well, probably, yeah, we will. But but you need to be thinking about that, setting it up. And and um, even like, you know, recently with polio, right? Who thought we were going to see uh, polio in the wastewater in New York City like they found it, right? So... Uh, we we need to be able to look for what we're we need to not only look for what we are planning on looking for, but we need to have the ability to look for what we don't expect to find. All right, Scott, and and after this, feel free to open it up to any of our uh, previous speakers as well. Okay, go so, ahead. So, uh, I, Cindy, thank you for that presentation. I think there's some really interesting triangulation between Rachel's presentation, Aaron's, and yours. Um, I, I had asked you about kind of what you're doing with the data and you said reporting to news. Um, yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah, I I think we are. I'm just double checking that. Um, well, but I we upload the raw sequences to NCBI. I was pretty sure that we also report to news, but yeah. I don't, I, I want to double check that. So I, I, I still, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how the data is being used. I mean, one of the concerns, if we're reporting news, that's that's fine. But then there's a timing issue that I, I have regarding how effective uh, the monitoring is being for, for the intended use. Um, 
but is there any more localized, more immediate response of that data provided to the local areas, the local health jurisdictions, uh, anything like that? So the, we don't have enough data to like really get at your question. We have like 120 wastewater samples. So we're, our crux of our program right now is the nasal sample where we have 300,000 samples. And that those data are reported to COVID Data Tracker weekly. They're uploaded to GISAID immediately after eight days. We've had a, a number of instances where we were six weeks ahead of the rest of the world finding a variant, reporting it, BA2, BA3, just now BA2.86, that everybody had 30 plus mutations and was out of the blue in three countries all at once. We found the first one in Asia from Japan, from a traveler who was there from 15 to 30 days. Um, and Japan didn't know they had it. They'd been doing a lot of sequencing. Ironically, they're a high income country. They were doing sequencing, but they were doing it all at the hospital in like, so like one location. So some bias sampling and didn't pick this up until just last week. They, and we found it in August. So we're, we can't, we are ahead of the game there. And what we think like the whole ideology of this is that we think wastewater from the plains will give us what we're getting already from the nasal swabs, not yeah. for everything. Like wastewater isn't good for, to, for flu serotyping, right? It's a segmented virus. You need the clinical sample. You can find flu, but you won't know if it's H1N1 or what it is, right? If you have a wastewater sample. So there are certain things that the nasal samples are better for you know, because we're doing the genomic sequencing. And so when we find something like BA 2.86, we can tell news, you start looking for that in the community, and then they know what to target and look for. So we're just not there yet. Like we don't have hundreds of thousands or thousands, hundreds of thousands of wastewater samples. I can envision that at some point, you know, we can move from nasal sampling to a pro the the wastewater sampling. Like if we had enough, we're doing some modeling to figure out what is the right number of airports to be at, what are the um, the right number of flights to get, and then then we can upload that data to a database, and that will have the same impact on public health, which is getting early detection and filling in the gaps in global surveillance. Again, it's not a consequence management program. We can't say like, oh, Mr. Smith came off flight 101 from Bangladesh and has COVID. Like, we don't know that. We're not, this is a voluntary anonymous program and the wastewater the same. Does that, I, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with the program. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're basically using it to, to narrow the focus on the targets um, and inform regarding these different strains, but it doesn't look like there's an immediate public health response based on your data as envisioned. Well, the for the nasal program there is, on the wastewater the it's new, so we right. just don't have enough yet. We're in, we're doing it at one airport. The The program's expanding and then the it should be, we would have a public health response. So for example, if you find a variant, um, in wastewater from an airplane, that's a new variant. Now it'd be better if you had a site in the UK and maybe one in Singapore, and then you could talk to your global network and see if anybody else is seeing that, because what are you gonna do if you find one off of something? But we'll have the sample and we can get that sample for viral characterization. Back to the BA 2.86 example, we were sending samples uh, to the CDC lab and that happened, that one from Japan happened to be, so it was even, we didn't even have to wait and send it. It was already on its way to CDC and they were able to do, you know, culture in the lab here because everybody was scrambling to get one of these BA 2.86. So it's early, it's early detection is important because you want to know if your countermeasures are going to work. You know, it's better to find out on entry in an airport than it when somebody's in the hospital bed or when you're out of ICU beds or ventilators or whatever. It's it's giving you that it's buying extra time to figure out your strategy. So it's okay. it's really early detection. And so we've shown that we can do it with the nasal sampling and we're trying to show that the 
the wastewater is just as good and it's low resource intensive. It's really not engaging with the traveler. It's not disrupting the airport operation. So really it's an easier way to do because if you think about lower and middle income countries, not every country can spend a ton of money doing huge programs. And if you wanna have a global network, you this is a really good tool that others can use for early detection. But we, we're proving it now. That's what our program's doing. We're scaling up. We're in the, you caught us at the beginning. So I can't tell you what we've done yet with wastewater, but I can tell you with the nasal samples, we've been able to do some good. And so are you, are, one last follow-up and I'll turn this over. Are, are you suggesting then that you plan to isolate live virus from wastewater if you get a signal? I am not a laboratorian <laughs> and I don't know if that is even possible. So, um, and that it sounds like it, it would be challenging. I would think. <laughs> so, um, so we have done that with nasal sampling. So th that's okay. why I was saying there are certain things that you can't do with wastewater that you can do with nasal samples. Um, but we, um, we can sequence and then we can get the nasal samples. We can ramp up nasal sampling. Like if we see something come in in wastewater from a region of the world, we can increase our nasal sampling program at that airport or at several airports where we're stationed and cover those flights. So for example, when China got rid of their um, zero COVID policy last Christmas, we quickly ramped up and opened two more airports and expanded hours and increased our coverage of flights in China, Hong Kong, Macau, and the region. And we're able to get like 250 flights that could have passengers from China because there were three sequences uploaded to GISAID from China at the time. And there were a million cases a day of COVID and nobody knew what the variant was gonna be. So we used the, we could scale up the nasal sampling program. So if we detect something in wastewater, we could scale up a nasal sampling program to culture a virus or to do what we need to do. Does that answer your question at all? I, I think so, thank you. Okay. Stephanie. So I have a question for um, several speakers, including some of the earlier ones. So if Miles and Justin can bring them into the panel. Um, we, we're primarily focused on news as a national system. And so part of the question here is trying to understand the value of local facility sampling, not only for local good, which is part of what news is trying to do, but to also think about how it benefits national response. And so I'm curious from the aspect of, you know, nursing homes, correctional facilities, schools, is there something that that, not just how it correlates with local wastewater treatment plants, but, but something that needs to come up to the national level that we need to understand from this? Or is it primarily just feeding a local response? Well, this, this is David Purse, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, Again, you know, my experience is just locally here in Houston, but I will tell you that we found that when we had nursing homes, for example, uh, we worked close to them, we would get their COVID numbers down to zero and their wastewater was, was clean. And then it would pop up again. And we would go in there and work with them. And quite honestly, what we found out, it was generally an employee who had brought it in. We also noticed that what we found was some, some nursing home employees are full-time employees with a nursing home. Others go from nursing home to nursing home to nursing home. And I want you to think about physical therapists. They'll go to, they'll spend two, three hours at one nursing home. Then they go to another nursing home, spend a couple hours there. Then go, well, working with our EPIs, we were able to find out that in several cases, it was the physical therapist who was bringing the COVID into hot, into nursing homes that were clean, if you will. Um, and so when you talk about it at a, at a national level, I don't know that I really have that perspective. But I will point out that we learned so much about, about disease control 
within nursing homes, as an example, and similarly within schools. Now, with schools, it's far more difficult because the kids spend part of the day at school, then they've got all these after school activities, and then they've got home. It was far more difficult. But working with the schools, again, we learned a lot about disease transmission within children. And so I, I think that there's an, an awful lot to be learned by doing this wastewater surveillance at, at Sentinel places and in specific places. Now, I'm not a national guy, so I, I, I don't want to get into somebody else's lane, but I, I will I will share with you that it, we learned things we never imagined we would have learned by taking the wastewater, which gave us the heads up, here's a problem. And then we started digging into it and, you know, call it peeling the wires away from the onion or whatever. It's really important information at the center of the onion that you don't know to look for um, without the water. Mark or Rachel? Sure, uh, I'll start. Um, it kind of follows up on this, but I, I think, and I asked that question about banking wastewater samples um, from the airports because, you know, we do that at, at O'Hare. And I, I think a lot about the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't know when COVID came to this country and where it was and how it was spreading. And had we had a freezer full of wastewater samples from O'Hare <laughs> or from anywhere, really, we would be able to go back to those and see when we first saw it and when it started um going up. And that's that's a, a kind of unique case of a respiratory virus that was spreading kind of silently throughout the country. But, you know, to follow up on those comments of transmission, like when when we think about other infectious diseases and their tra their transmission routes are different and their um, uh, <laughs> NEPA keeps coming up, like there 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 are different transmission routes and, and different um, different vulnerable populations. And so if we uh, kind of to your question about, you know, how national responses to these facility level sites or, or sentinel sites, um, we can know things about like, do we see it? it is it so CORS is where we're looking in long term acute care hospitals, skilled nursing facilities where Zorus is is a big problem. It's not as much of a problem um, in in other you types. Rumor about a lockdown at Episcopal High School. In in other types of. You guys know anything about it? So, uh, yeah, I think just knowing like how how things are being trans transmitted and and where is really useful for for a national perspective. But but you, yeah, you have to know what you kind of know what you're looking for. Look for patterns. I think so the the couple things that that come to my mind on it are one is uh again kind of comes back to those levers are you trying to control something are you trying to limit something are you trying like are you trying to do some kind of reaction or are you trying to get ahead of it just with the information gathering right so just knowing that you have a threat ahead of you you have the ability to start figuring out what are your plans in place to be able to try to avoid it what I and there are a couple things I I kind of come to think about this when 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 we're talking about this. So or questions like this. So one is, um, do we have a generalized plan? Right. So is there some kind of like so if we find it in an airport versus a train station, or if we find it in a hospital versus an elder care facility, there there's probably a plan, or there should be a plan. Please, there's a, please let there be a plan that of what we would do because we see that. And if there isn't one, then that, that might be a piece to this that we need to think through is what does that plan look like? How do we structure it? How does it tear up? How does it ramp back down? All those things to be able to make it that we can respond that much more effectively rather than react. Because you don't want to react to something, you want to respond to it in an intelligent, controlled manner. Um, if it's more along the lines of discovery of where is this new variant going to be evolving to or... Um, what's the next threat that's going to be coming down the line that we need to be prepared for, then that is something that probably a national network would actually be representative of. But when it comes to levers of control, that's really very much a localized area except for specific levers, right? If you're going to now control transport to a specific location or you're going to try and control uh, movements 
within a specific area or a specific region. Um, you know, when we started up on the the uh, correctional facilities, we had a significant number of cases and deaths. We were filling up OSU Hospital on a regular basis. And because we put in a number of different controls that were environmentally based and then backed it up with verifying whether or not those, those controls were working using wastewater, we started etching down further and further because we could start tweaking those environmental controls that little bit better. So at that smaller scale, it works great for levers of control. At the, and as soon as you start scaling that up, it just like any kind of modeling, you're, you're, that's when your biggest biggest issues. So it's kind of a split between the discovery side of things and getting ahead of the curve or whether or not you want to try and control something. I think one of the challenges we have uh, um, in, in looking at this for a national wastewater surveillance system to kind of build on what Stephanie had raised is, is kind of the spatial and temporal distribution of testing. That is, um, do we need six places with the capacity and capability of Houston to inform what happens nationally? Or do you need, it, from an early example from the pandemic, uh, the front range of Utah had 42 different sites. And the question, I kind of raised this earlier um, with, with Lauren uh, Stadler is, you know, at what point, given limited resources in the new system, um, you know, you can't test every side every day for local action to make a national system functional is one of our big challenges is, is what is the optimal sustainable design for, um, for sampling and, and analysis. Um, the, the clear answer is it all depends, um, which makes for a very short report, um, and and one of our challenges is to try to bring some some structure to that from the perspective not only of what works locally but for this national system. So, um, uh, welcome to have any comments on that uh, currently or in writing subsequently. I don't know who was next, Lauren or Susanna. Um, I think Lauren was next. I was just going to okay. make a quick comment, kind of piggybacking on some of what you said, which is, you know, yeah, it really, yeah, it all depends. And I think, and also piggybacking on what Dr. Purse said and that it's, we've learned a lot from the facility level surveillance to understand transmission. And we've also learned a lot from pairing the facility level surveillance with the citywide surveillance and, you know, and really we should think about scale this right to the national surveillance to think about how these, you know, different scales tell us different information and for different targets, you know, it it might be quite different, right? So, like for example, we have done some surveillance at you know nursing homes where we reliably detect certain pathogen targets that we don't see reliably at the downstream wastewater treatment plant. And I think, you know, for a lot of these new targets that are going to be diverse in structure, new types of pathogens, we're going to have to do this type of work again and again to really understand kind of you know, where we can reliably detect certain types of targets um, and then balance that with, yeah, these national goals of surveillance. Um, and also, you know, a lot of our facility level stuff has really stood up, stood, was stood up again for having the intervention being more actionable when we do detect that target. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Susanna, you had a comment? Yeah, and I'm not sure I will say much, <laughs> anything new, but it's so, and Mark was also saying it depends on the goal, right? And we are now thinking about it also with the other targets. And I don't think we can generalize say, sites for all targets, right? That's just not going to happen. And for example, if I want to do norovirus, you know, I can do it. I can learn from it so much from surveillance. I don't think we know that much. I think there is so much more norovirus and the dynamics is, might be possibly different than what we believe and things like that. So there is still so many things we can learn from wastewater about diseases, but also if I want to do it as a support outbreak investigation, then I want to have a flexible network where I can turn on and off wastewater or sampling in certain areas where I have outbreak. So, so it's just a very tricky question if it's statewide or nationally, it will so much depends on what I'm trying to achieve and what's the target, right? And 
And I don't think there will be generalized question for, you know, for any of these. We could say we could focus, if it's emerging pathogen and coming, then you want to focus on airports and maybe highways, right? And so again, it, it's, it just so depends. <laughs> All right, I think Dr. Purse and then Aaron yeah. Bivens. Yeah, I just want to make one quick comment. You know, when it comes from, again, this is a perspective of the local person, but uh, and what I'm going to talk about has nothing to do with wastewater. But, you know, we had this situation with hepatitis A in San Diego that spread to Los Angeles and spread to Phoenix. And then almost simultaneously, there was a slightly different strain that in the Detroit area. And when we got that information, we turned around here locally and got with our a lot of our local partners in the healthcare for the homeless and so on and so forth. And we went out into homeless camps and started giving away hepatitis A vaccines to anybody who would take it. Now, that situation had nothing to do with wastewater. But the point was, you know, by paying attention to what was going on nationally and getting that information, that was just for me reading the newspapers and, and so on and so forth. I got the heads up that, hey, something's going on up here. I've got a tool to help protect my community. And we got people out under bridges and into those homeless camps and trying to protect folks. So, you know, that wasn't wastewater, but I can't see why a national wastewater system, you know, wouldn't have the same the same ability to give us. Again, it's an early warning system. And if it's an early warning system for something that's actionable, I now know to take action, which I otherwise would not have known. Aaron. I think um, I don't know when I think when I think about this system, um, I think about like the traditional clinical surveillance, right, which is very specific, but also resource intensive. You need people to present for uh, treatment. You have syndromic surveillance, right, which is not very specific, but maybe is is a leading edge. And so the wastewater to me it kind of strikes a nice balance in that it's very specific, but it's also providing a lead compared to traditional clinical surveillance. And without sacrificing the specificity of a diagnostic. Um, and so in my mind, there's a couple of things that can happen in response to that data. Number one, you, you can inform your syndromic surveillance and your traditional surveillance. Um, I kind of think of like a Bayesian, right? You have a prior and a posterior. And so you're able to use this wastewater data to better inform your screening of, uh, on these layers. And then also, you know, we can ask, we ask people to, uh, I guess, engage in different individual behavior, wear a mask, um, social distance, things of that nature. But what we found is that people are, you know, they're not rational, right? So it's, uh, uh, it's you know, that becomes fraught with other difficulties. I think one idea that's really interesting is the idea that we manipulate, begin manipulating the environment in response to these signals, especially at the institutional level. Um, and I think, you know, one thing we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is that our, our environment, how we design our environment, how we build things, we're going to have to do a better job of designing it to prevent infectious disease. And so I can imagine a, a world where, you know, you have these environmental surveillance signals that are linked into your building controls and your buildings, um, are going to respond to, the, the risk level that you're seeing based on what you're observing in the environment. So, and, and that way we circumvent human behavior, which is, you know, a fickle thing. So big picture, that's kind of what I think about um, with these type stuff. Uh, obviously it's going to take a private some time to build to that, but um, that's kind of where I'm interested in going long-term. Mark. So, Aaron. Aaron, you're kind of um, hearkening back to the uh, was the metabolism of cities. I think it is. So it's basically how healthy is a city. So something that I think that is a really interesting way of thinking of it. You know, the, when when we sit down and we think about like so, like I'm in the sustainability institute. Whenever we sit down and do these group things about what's the next step in sustainability, a lot of it really ends up being it's not just the next trendy thing for low energy you know, um, for all these different things or, or, or product advancement. It's really significant rethinking of why isn't there a train that goes from Cleveland to Columbus to Cincinnati, right? Like very simple stuff like that. And then this is one of those examples. There is a side to it though, um, that we have to be 
cognizant of, I think. And that is, you know, there was the, uh, I think it was a group in Australia that was trying to, you know, effectively demonstrate based on the the demographics of the population and neighborhood, what's the likelihood of these lifestyle uh, health impacts that you would expect to see. And that's a very problematic thing to think about because it's putting in generalizations and sometimes spurious correlations of health effects to a particular demographic group that doesn't have that mechanistic link that something like infectious disease tracking would. Um, there's an interest in looking at cancer markers in different populations. But the problem you have with that is now, is it a transient population? Is it a consistent population? So the classic issues that we have in wastewater, wastewater monitoring and decision-making. But then on top of that is the the ability for you to really start now targeting at a personal level whether or not you can actually do something right so i think there's the national picture of what is it that we can do to try and prevent a large scale impact like we have been seeing in the covid 19 pandemic how do we try and get ahead of a pandemic in the future i mean those are all all doable and i love the idea of metabolism of cities to get a better idea of what people are actually doing how the city itself is healthy and things like that um I think we also then have to sit down and think about the ethics of something like that if it gets expanded in that direction. But you can even do the same thing on the infectious disease side. How how available do we have the the um, the people's trust and power that they've given to us to be able to control any of these levers if we we start finding ourselves holding them? All right, we've reached the top of the hour, and I think we could have this discussion go on for some some length of time because it's certainly interesting um, perspectives and, and really appreciate your expertise in, in helping guide the committee. I'm sure we'll be reaching out to some of you uh, for some additional guidance uh, as we as we continue to convene and work on a report. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, really appreciate it uh, taking your time to to help us out.